long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series and beyond. I am your host, constant reader Scott Daly, crawling out of a morgue drawer to feast upon the living. And I'm King newbie Matt Freeman, and praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you even Catholic? I am now. This week on the show, it is another episode covering only one chapter of Salem's Lot. We are back with the citizens of the lot as we discuss chapter 10, The Lot 3. With both Ben and Matt stuck in the hospital, Barlow's grip on the town of Salem's Lot tightens. There's fucking vampires everywhere, Matt. What did you think of this week's reading? Well, like you said, there's vampires everywhere, but it's kind of, I don't know what word to use, fascinating how we start out this section in this lengthy, extremely artistic diversion in, into uh, kind of soulful analysis of living in small town America. And mm-hmm. um, I don't know, I, I think this is one of the sections where, you know, the themes of what King is is trying to do with this story are, are most prominent, I would say. Yeah, I think you're right, um, especially like between that opening four pages and then Barlow's monologue as to why he chose Salem's Lot, I think it really kind of starts to, to crystallize exactly what King is trying to say with this story. Absolutely. And so we're going to have a lot to say about both of those sections. I think the hardest thing for me is going to be not just reading all six pages of the, of the opening because I, I I pulled like six different giant paragraphs. I swear to God, I'm not going to read them all, but I don't know how to talk about this, this without like really diving into what makes the writing so inherently fascinating with the opening of this chapter. Yeah. You know, it's funny the format that the way we do this, the way we've always done these shows that follow this format is to, you know, do a certain number of pages or a certain number of chapters or what have you. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately some writing just requires way more analysis than others. Sure, sure. Um, and like the like, I agree. Like those few pages, you could just we could just do a whole two hours on those on those pages. We're yeah. not going to be able to devote that to it, but I think we're gonna we're gonna spend some good time on it. We're, we're gonna spend some time. Sure, uh, it's 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 beautiful. Like it's one of those things where I forget about this. I, I've read this book a few times. I think I think three and. I always forget about the opening of this chapter every time I reread it. And then like I turn to it and I start reading and it just, it just blows me away once again. Awesome. Awesome. So can't wait to really dive into it with you. I've never gotten to do that. So it's going to be fun. Yeah. Uh, before we get into the chapter, we just had some very quick announcements. One of them is we just wanted to circle back around to our poetry corner. We got a lot of positive feedback from y'all about that. So first we just wanted to say thank you. I think we had an English teacher comment on our reddit stop being so hard on yourself everyone's just pretending like they know what these poems mean anyway um which is really comforting and now <laughs> i'm a i'm a poetry expert i've officially declared it and now it is true yeah now i'm going to be obnoxiously self-confident about my interpretations <laughs> which is which is a huge improvement i assume we also had a user uh dom Nambulist, i probably said that wrong uh comment on the second poem that we talked about um which i i called a haiku and i think you kind of pointed out later scott that's not actually a haiku i think it's it in the original greek it was a haiku in its english translation it was not but the other thing that this user pointed out to us is that th- the german translation of the poem was a little bit different than our translation of the poem um, in the German translation of the poem, it explicitly states that it is a Greek column with a hole in it. And instead of looking in and seeing the queen of the dead, it specifically says Persephone, um, which changes the meaning or at least opens it up to different interpretations pretty dramatically. I think. Yeah. I mean, Persephone is a very different figure from your, your sort of generic uh, conceptual queen of the dead, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Pers- Persephone is indeed the queen of the dead, but only by technicality. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the, for, for those that maybe don't remember, the important part about Persephone is she lives half of her life um, in the overworld and half of her life in the underworld. And in Greek mythology, the reason we have seasons is because Persephone in the wintertime is in the underworld, is in hell or the Greek version of hell, not really. But um that does change the meaning quite a bit, right? Um, and I think Dom Nambulus goes on to kind of, uh, they've never read this book, but just, they're and they're following along with this real time, and, and they made a prediction that perhaps the Persephone figure in the story is our, our, our lead female character, Susan, um, which, which would not bode well for her future. Yes, yes, that's very interesting. Um, as, we, as we transition into the winter times in Salem's Lot, is Persephone going to be going into the underworld? 
Right. I mean, we did previously think like maybe there was going to be a queen of the dead within the story. And, and mm-hmm. so, yeah, maybe mm-hmm. there's going to be a Persephone more specific stand in. Although you have to ask, does Stephen King know <laughs> that it was supposed to be Persephone? Yeah. Because, I mean, that's a good point. I, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it, because this was a Greek haiku, um, it, it, it makes me think that like it, this could just be a particularly bad translation of the Greek. Like I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain that he probably wrote Persephone in the original Greek, right? Like, or, or when they, when he wrote the queen of the dead, it was meant to obviously be a reference to Persephone as it was in Greek. And it probably did not say queen of the dead, but like queen of the underworld or something that made it more obvious that it was Persephone. I don't know. It's, it's really fascinating though. It is fascinating. I'm so confused though. Why? Um, Well, I'm just wondering what the last line would Persephone is already four syllables. It's, it's I, Greek, man. I, I don't know. Fine. Is Persephone like I, I don't know. When don't was know. this poem written? I don't know. The twenties. Okay. The, I I don't know. It's very interesting. I did so. So I had this thought, which is it, this is just wrong. It's just totally wrong. <laughs> but but I had this thought that was like maybe it's maybe it's a maybe it's an incorrect haiku on purpose and like the flaw of the meter is supposed to indicate the hole and you know the 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 gap the the opening into the into the underworld Mm -hmm. um but that's just uh, that's nonsense because apparently it's (laughs) yeah anyway who knows who knows i've not read the original greek um i also think it is really interesting like the column with a hole we talked about architecture immediately which the the translation that this user talked about was more specific to greek column but they also said before they heard read the the german translation they kind of made the assumption that a column with a hole could be talking about a grave, um, specifically like a, a, a dugout grave. Uh-huh. And then Greek column kind of makes it more explicitly an architectural design. I don't know. It, interesting choices here on on the English translation. Yeah, that is interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know what to do with this beyond beyond what well, we've already badgered this poor poem enough. <laughs> let's, let's leave it be for yeah. now. Yeah, we spent way more time thinking about this than it probably took to write it. <laughs> a quick but a very exciting announcement before we move on. We are excited to say that as of this week, we're taking submissions for the Do the King Thing short fiction contest. That's right, Matt. This is a riff on another contest we sometimes run on this network via one of our um, sister pot. How, how do what do we Part, call partner partner podcasts? <laughs> yeah. It's called Do the Right Thing. It's a writing prompt podcast designed to encourage our listeners to practice writing a weekly short story in just 30 minutes or less. So it's a riff on this podcast. That's right. This time, though, we're asking listeners to submit their Stephen King-esque short stories. Stephen King-esque meaning whatever that means to you. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Uh, The the first prize is uh, your choice of $125 uh, US dollars or an exquisite copy of Misery, printed by the Folio Society, which is well known for making just the most beautiful, uh, well-made uh, books. Yeah, they're usually illustrated editions as well. It's amazing. The Misery copy looks great. You probably want that. Just, I'm just saying, <laughs> you can make up your own mind, but that's probably the one you want. Second prize is seventy-five U.S. dollars, and third prize is twenty-five U.S. dollars. And additionally, uh, we will be releasing a special episode on the Kingslingers feed where Scott. Uh, and I, I guess I should say, or I, uh, <laughs> read all three of the top uh, three stories. Um, so that, that'll be fun. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, your submission should be a maximum of 2,000 words. These are supposed to be quick, bite-sized, short stories. And we'll be taking submissions until midnight Pacific time on the 15th of July. You can find a link in the show notes of this very episode, which will break down all the rules, regulations, and details you need to figure out how to do this. Um, so make sure you check that out. And And I hope you guys participate. I know there's probably a lot of you out there that are writers, and we hope you guys give this thing a shot. This is a contest we've done before with some of our other shows, and uh, and our our, our listeners always get a kick at it. And we hope you guys do, too. So that's the Do the King Thing short fiction contest. Yeah, 2,000 words is very doable. So good luck. Absolutely. Good luck, everyone. We can't wait to see what you guys submit. All right, let's move into our chapter discussion and begin with our only chapter of the week, chapter 10, The Lot 3. And as we said in our introduction, chapter 10 begins with King flexing his writing muscles once again. We open with this very kind of tone setting line here. 
the town knew about darkness. And then it goes on to say, the town is an accumulation of three parts, which in some are greater than the section. The town is the people who live there, the buildings which they have erected to den or do business in, and it is the land. And I think it is the land part that that King spends the most time on. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's interesting. I like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, th- this this whole large section is such an amazingly daring departure from the style up to this point. Yeah, it, yeah. It's the sort of thing I really admire about King. It, it would never, it, it's not that I would like lack the the gumption to do this. It's that it would never occur to me to do something like this, <laughs> but to just like draw this operatic sketch of small town despair in the middle of my vampire book. Yeah. And he he's flirted with it before. Like, I think that we've, t- we talked about the telephone wire speech in the middle of, of that section, you know, where he kind of intentionally shifts into a kind of different tone, a different gear of writing. But this is the most extensive piece that he's done in the book so far. Um, and it is like, I think it is a master storyteller kind of shooting a shot, you know, like this yeah. is, this is him tossing the three ball and then holding the arm up uh, as the as it swishes into the net i've been watching a lot of basketball it's uh, <laughs> it's playoff seasons but um i think i think this it's wonderful and it's powerful and i think as you said it really gets right down to the middle of what king is trying to say with small towns which i think is a little bit more complicated than just a fuck small town people stance right yeah Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's very complicated. I don't, I don't think, I don't think I have quite managed to pin down what exactly it is because he's saying that there is evil in in the town, but he, I don't think he's saying like everybody who lives in small towns is, is bad. Like, I, yeah. I, th- I think he's, he might be saying, and this is a very vague kind of stab, but I think he's saying there's something about the dynamic of a small town that allows evil to take root and fester yeah i mean i want to i I pulled out this extremely this is one sentence and it's an extremely long sentence but it's worth reading here and i I think i think this is a good place to start this conversation um so we're we're kind of king his, his structure for this whole thing at least the beginning of it is to put us in the head of a a hypothetical resident of the town not anyone specific but just a a a general broad this is what it's like to be a person living in this town and so we follow this person through their their life and their a usual planting season a farmer living in this town and we get this this one sentence right here and putting on a new blade getting your oldest boy to hold up the hitch so you can get at it the first mosquito of the new season buzzes buzzes blood thirstily past your ear with that eye-watering hum that always makes you think it's the sound loonies must hear just before they kill all the kids or close their eyes on the interstate and put the gas pedal to the floor or tighten their toe on the trigger of the 3030 they just jammed into their quackers then your boy's sweat slicked fingers slip and one of the other round harrow blades scrape skin from your arm and looking around in that kind of despairing heartless flicker of time when it seems you could just give it all over and take up drinking or go down to the bank that holds your mortgage and declare bankruptcy at that moment of hating the land and the soft suck of gravity that holds you to it you also love it and understand how it knows darkness and has always known it so i mean it's it's really interesting right because we have this this kind of we're painting a picture of what it's like to just be an average person in this town. And it is this picture of utter hopelessness at times where like the struggle to just live the struggle to like this whole section starts when you go out and you go to your field because the ground is so rough there and stones poke up through it that you just fill an entire truck filled with stones. And then you start tilling your land and invariably after the second row will hit a stone you missed. And then you, you, you're, you put the new blade on and of course a, a mosquito buzzes by and your kid's arm slips and you slice your, it's just like pain and misery and hard work and desperation and the willingness or, or, or the creeping sense and desire of just giving up. Yeah, right. The, the, there's that negative side, but then almost each one of these sentences as we go through this remarks on how it's like, you you hate it you resent it it's 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 a feeling of despair but also it's it's uh seductive it's Mm -hmm. it's it's like you you love it at the same time i mean this paragraph says you love and understand Mm -hmm. how it knows darkness at the same time that you hate it um this just popped into my head i want to say it before we move on just so i don't forget um the, the the idea of the farmer having to 
dig the the rocks out of out of the you know out of the crappy crappy soil um reminds me very much of uh the, the kala yeah 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 i was um, thinking that too as i read it um because they had I, I think they had that whole i can't remember what the what they called the field i think it was like called the bitch or something yeah, like uh, that yeah i thought it was um, like son of a bitch or something like yeah, that yeah that the one field that just that, that they try to plow every time but can't yeah, yeah. I, very much very much generating a same kind of existence in in this right. in in the Cala versus salem's law which is interesting right because in caliber and sturgis it was specifically a town that was teetering on hopelessness because they were quite literally being farmed um right. for their children and that is not quite what's going on in salem's lot but also isn't it in a way yeah well i think the most obvious connection at, at this moment in this context is that that was a town that was basically rife with with this this sort of evil this sort of like compromise mm -hmm. where everyone was just going along with it and pretending that it was okay and pretending that it was normal because they didn't want to have to face the evil to yeah. to, to to fight um and uh so you know i don't i don't know how much further that sort of comparison is going to take us because i mean ultimately there's going to be people who have to fight the vampires but i don't think there's going to be anything like the the brave stand of the Kala against the wolves. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 now that I've, now that we've picked out this comparison, I really think that there's something to it. Sure. Sure. I also love this feeling. Like not only do you hate this town and hate this land and love, but, and love it, but there's also this feeling of being trapped. I, I, I love this quote right here. The land has got you locked up solid, got you and the house and the woman you fell in love with when you started high school, only she was a girl then. You didn't know for shit about girls, except you got one and hung on to her and she wrote your name all over her book cover and you first broke her in and then she broke you in and then neither one of you had to worry about that mess anymore. And the kids have got you. The kids that were started in the creaky double bed with the splintered headboard. And so it's this idea that like this, this idea that you, you love this place, but it also is suffocating and trapping you that, that the land has hooked you to it and everything on the land the woman, the the kids, like it's just, this. I think a, a broader feeling of how your life kind of weighs you down with the responsibilities that come with it. But specific, it, it starts with the land there, which is so interesting to me. Right. So it's like that first sentence you read was about the land, and the second sentence is is actually about the people, because mm -hmm. because the the three the three parts that King described is the people, the buildings, and the land. So this yeah. is the people where you. You make this, you either find or, or make this network of human beings that tie you to the land and, and now you can't, you know, you can't leave, right? Like the, this, you know, the, the, the protagonist of this little vignette, this sort of, this nameless man, I, I suppose, um, he, he can never leave the town, right? Like he'd have to move his whole family out yeah. and that's not going to happen because he doesn't have the money for that and there's no prospects. And it, so he's, he's just stuck. Right. But, but, you know, and I, but like, it, it, again, I don't find this to be altogether negative. Like it's this, this interesting sort of bittersweet description where it's like, sure. it's like, yeah, you, you fell in love with a girl and started a family and it's like, yes. And there was, there, there's, there's a tremendous amount of good in that, but also each, each incremental, you know, further notch of commitment is, is another, another, irrevocable stake driven into the land yeah you're just never going to leave well and i i think what what this is saying most to me is you know we kind of started this story talking about how uh, the, you know the first the lot chapter we, we took a tour of salem's lot and met everyone and everyone had a secret and everyone had something terrible that they were doing and everyone there seemed to be terrible behavior and and as this sentence is talking about a, a darkness going on in this town and in, in its people and and it really gave you this idea that king is like look at these small town shitty monstrous people right and i think we're complicating it here because what this is saying to me is it's kind of they're just people caught in a vicious cycle of of the land has darkness in it and so it breeds darkness in the people which put that darkness back in the land and it's just this this cycle that no one can escape from and it's not even necessarily the fault of the people that 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 they're like this that this this place becomes this kind of cycle of abuse and and secrets and lies and horribleness and that that breeds the kind of darkness that is eventually going to destroy it right 
yeah yeah i i think that's true i i think i think it has more to do with the system right mm-hmm. it's more to mm-hmm. do with the system than, than the people yeah um and, and i think the the thing about this and and we'll get to this when we talk about barlow's section is we have this part which really you know goes into the you can say that this is specific to a conversation about what it's like to live in this town but it's also a conversation of basically like what it's like to be poor and and desperate at which a lot of these people are and and the the contrast to this is when barlow comes in near the end of this chapter and basically says these people have never known want have never like really known hunger like it's this very kind of we go through this long long vignette of this this guy who's just suffering just to make like ends meet and just to survive and and the 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 struggle of it and then this this man kind of comes into town this foreigner comes into town and says you don't even understand what struggle is it's a very interesting difference in in these two sides of of the view of this town is and i kind of want to when we get to the barlow section i really want to pick at that because i'm i'm not 100 percent sure what that's going for there it is funny because i didn't even really notice the contradiction until you pointed it out there but i mean on the surface it's just that barlow is from like medieval europe or something where it's like (laughs) everybody's just starving to death and dying of plague constantly Mm -hmm. which based on my understanding of history is not that far off the mark so so in a relative sense yeah we're doing pretty great but sure um uh yeah I, let's let's i'll think about that in one half of my brain while the other half continues to podcast with you all right i'll take half of matt okay all right let's talk about this quote half of matt being in the town is a daily act of utter intercourse so complete that it makes what you and your wife do in the squeaky bed look like a handshake being in the town is prosaic sensuous alcoholic And in the dark, the town is yours, and you are the towns, and together you sleep like the dead, like the very stones in your north field. There is no life here but the slow death of days, and so when the evil falls on the town, its coming seems almost preordained, sweet, and morphic. It's almost as though the town knows that this evil was coming, and the shape it would take. Um. (sighs) So this is this is the most interesting to me. Um, yeah, I, I, I love the shit out of this passage. From from a writing point of view, there's a few things I want to talk about. Um, there's a thousand things we could talk about, but I want to pull out the words alcoholic and morphic uh, because sure. I find them to be very surprising and interesting choices. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, to call being in the town alcoholic is such a unique way of using that word, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. what's funny is that we know what he means. <laughs> uh-huh. It's like it's never a way that I would use the word alcoholic, but... But yeah, like, like sometimes, I mean, I I don't know about you, but sometimes I find doing normal things in life can carry a feeling of like an altered state of consciousness. And so I, I, you sort of get it when it's like, it's being in the town carries with it all of those same aspects of, of the state of consciousness of being drunk, perhaps where Mm -hmm. like you, 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 there's, there's nothing to worry about. You're in the town, just like when you're drunk. Um, yeah, and, and this feeling that that, that the, the thing that is providing that to you is also simultaneously destroying you. That like just yeah. being in this town is both um, mind altering in the way that makes you feel better about yourself, while quietly destroying you. Yeah, right. Like like the like the man who goes to the bar to drink to forget his troubles, and then mm-hmm. the fact that he goes to the bar to drink every night is a huge part of his troubles. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that, that is the town. Right. Mm-hmm. And then the second interesting word morphic is equally interesting, I think, because it's sort of not a word actually. Like, like if you look up the <laughs> word morphic, um, it actually just means like of or pertaining to shape or form as yeah. in like morphology. I mean like the mighty morphic power rangers, right? Like, like the mighty morphic power rangers. Exactly, Scott. But you know, we understand that that's not how King is using it. He's using it. Tell me if you disagree. But I think he's using it more along the lines of like Morpheus as in sleepy, uh, you know, per- perhaps along the lines of that connection with alcoholic, he's relating it to morphine, a drug that makes you makes you sleepy, makes you just just accept, you know, b- become passive, become numb to, to pain. Um, so anyway, in the end, we have we have alcoholic, we have morphic. And in the end, you know, I, what I take away from from this passage is is this very direct connection between the town and being drugged or being in a drugged state of mind. And I think that's spot on too, because of the the number of beats we've had throughout this book of either either events in the story taking place 
in bars where the denizens of the town go after a long work or circling around characters uh, struggle with alcoholism, whether it be direct in characters like Weasel or a little more indirect in in Ben's kind of in, in, the character of Ben is increasingly attached to the consumption of alcohol in ways that he doesn't understand. But then, and then, of course, we have Father Callahan is the is the biggest, most direct one, I think. Yeah, right. So, yeah, I mean, all these all these characters are using alcohol in, in a way that the town is. I, I love your idea of Morphic. I mean, I, I got to say, like, my original idea was just sh- changing that only because of the next line and almost as though the town knows the evil was coming and the shape it would take, you know? So like that, that, that this thing is going to, this evil is going to come and it's going to morph the town into something else. But I mean, under the context of what you just said, like it does seem like sweet yeah. and morphic. I think in that, in that context, I think you're onto something there that that seems to ally more with the morphine yeah. Morpheus type type of meaning like you're drifting away into a peaceful sleep that's going to come and take you um yeah which i mean i could like i could be wrong but the fact that it works either way i think is sort of yet another um fun writing thing where where you you can use words that carry connotations that the word doesn't technically have (laughs) Mm -hmm. um yeah I, i think i think this is this is very cool. And, and like, like we said, I think at the top of the episode, like this is one of the things that makes me feel like this section is, is very much tied into the, the, the themes um, where, where, you know, essentially he's, I think directly, I guess, I guess I'll say it this way up until this point, it seemed like we have this theme over here of alcohol abuse and broadly substance abuse. And this theme over here of the town and its recurrent power of evil um, mm-hmm. and, and now this is sort of the, the, these passages are kind of joining those two things and saying the town is like a substance that the people living in the town are abusing in the same way that they abuse alcohol. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I, I love like not to go over things again, but that line prosaic, sensuous and alcoholic. Mm-hmm. It, those are such great words to use here, like prosaic and then sensuous back to back are just like, that's fascinating to me that it's not directly contradictory but you know like it's calling something prosaic but then also saying it's sensuous i don't know i don't know there's something like it, it, they're not are they i don't know are they directly contradicting each other almost but they, not they, they're just such different words they are, yeah, they are. i mean pr- prosaic it's funny because i had the definition of prosaic wrong in my head for like most of my life that i, I thought oh, it meant like I, th- I thought prosaic meant poetic <laughs> when oh, in no, fact it's the, it's it, it exact means the opposite, opposite of poetic. Yeah. It means, it means yeah. commonplace. Um, yep. So it's basically, yeah, it's like it's, it's commonplace, sensuous and alcoholic. I, I think it's just that sensuous has what I think of as just being an unrelated meaning where it's, it's. Uh, I, I guess so. Like I, I, when I think of prosaic and I think of the opposite of poetic, like poetic says like beautiful and, and, and triggering of the senses, you know, like, like romantic. And that's what I think of as poetic. And so when I think of prosaic, I think of the opposite of romantic, the opposite, like I, and then the word sensuous comes in here, which, which is not to say you cannot have a a sensuous feeling that is just normal. Like that's certainly possible, but it just seems on first pull that, oh, those words kind of contradict each other. Well, Here's one thing that kind of sums to my mind would be like, this wouldn't be altogether inappropriate to describe like a character entering a brothel where it's like, it's, yeah, it's certainly not like a beautiful place. It's pro it's prosaic. It's alcoholic. And in in you could say it's alcoholic in the sense that you're probably going to be drinking and you're going to be pushed into an altered state of consciousness, but it's also definitely sensuous, right? It's um for, for some reason, mm, this, this all true. kind of muddles together in my mind with the idea of like vampires and vampires being very sensuous creatures. Yeah. Um, in most, in most, uh, literature, but not prosaic, <laughs> not, not prosaic. Yeah. But I think you're right. There is something, you know, there's something to the, the vamp, especially in this, in this story, the, the way the vampires get you in the story is there is that, that old romantic notion of vampirism um where they kind of lull you in and and promise you 
the exact thing that you want and kind of hypnotize you. And it, it's, I think there is a direct line to be taken to the ways in which King is describing the town here and the ways in which vampires kind of offer to solve your problem. And maybe that's exactly what they're saying. It's like, it's coming seems almost preordained, like sweet and morphic because this is what the town was. And now they're just living manifestations of the town making it literal. Yeah. I like that. All right. So uh, King then goes on from this beautiful, uh, not prosaic language to show the town and its secrets. And and the interesting thing about this is we knew the town had secrets and we knew that, 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 that there is gossip amongst this town. But we kind of learned that there's two levels of this, right? There's the dark underbelly that everyone knows about. And then there's the under of the dark underbelly, which almost no one knows about. So we learned these things that like Marston was corresponding with some some guy in Europe Right, some guy in Europe that uh-huh. is definitely not Barlow. It's probably unrelated to anything. It definitely is Barlow. I don't know if you caught that. I, we're kind of jumping ahead, but when Barlow was explaining why he's here, he said, "Oh yeah, I, I communicated with a denizen of your town years ago." I, I I did. I mean, I think we're meant to wonder, and maybe it's not going to be answered beyond this point. But like, I was like, wait, so like, is part of the reason why why Marston killed himself like because he had these evil dealings with vampires and and it, and it became too much for him or yeah i mean um, we learned that his wife as he was as he blew his wife's head off she was asking him to do it yeah. and we don't we know like it's dark and terrible but we don't really get the details of it and didn't he like burn about like he carefully burned all the letters before he killed himself yeah yeah, yeah. so so I, I think i mean i don't know I'd, i i guess i'm saying at this point i'd be surprised if we didn't learn more about what exactly was going on there Sure, sure. Well, we'll find out. Okay. Uh, We learned that the fire of 1951 uh, was started, that someone started it, some teenager started it. Uh, We learned that Floyd Tibbetts is a vampire now, which you were right on that, Matt. Good job. Um, Um, Took me a bit, but I got there. (laughs) We learned that Hal Griffin is a pervert and that George Midler wears women's clothing. And uh, both Carl Foreman and the little baby Randall Mc- Randy McDougal are also vampires now. So I love what King does here is, is kind of like mix the mundane secrets and the, and the supernatural secrets like, Oh, this man dresses in women's clothing. Sometimes that's just a mundane secret. He keeps to himself. And then, Oh, but also this person's a vampire now. Um, and the way he kind of intercuts those together, I think is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think sort of based on the thematic self we were just talking about, I mm-hmm. think the idea is like the, the supernatural is just a logical extension of what's been happening the whole time. Yeah. And then the conclusion of this section ends on this. The town cares for devil's work no more than it cares for God's or man's. It knew darkness and darkness was enough. That's really interesting, right? Um, Because you have vampires, which normally are representative of the devil or the evil um, that is opposed to God, right? And so we're saying the town does not lean towards the devil or toward God. It only knows about darkness and that's enough for these creatures to come here. Yeah. That's really interesting because man, this is so funny to me because I wrote an essay in a college course about the use of the word darkness in a completely different book. (laughs) Um, It was actually a a memoir by bell hooks. Interesting. Um, But the point, the point being that in that book, uh, uh, darkness is a symbol where, um well and i think in this one as well actually like like what are the qualities of darkness well it hides things it it Mm -hmm. allows you to hide things it's not it's not actually a purely negative thing um because there's no nothing intrinsically negative about darkness it's just the absence of light but but one thing that darkness allows is is the hiding of secrets yeah um and, and so when he says darkness when king uses darkness here i'm actually somewhat inclined to think what does he mean exactly? I think what he means is the the darkness which hides secrets. Sure. Um, not, not just generic darkness, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it builds a really interesting juxtaposition to the last time King went on this kind of poetic tangent about the town where what we learned then was about gossip. And so we've got this idea of of the the knowledge of the town that everyone knows how we, we've been talking about this through the throughout the entire book so far that, and we were joking about last week how ben gets back to his boarding house and everyone there knows about his news before he 
get even told him because it traveled faster than he does. So we've got this this town in which stuff is constantly passed around. Everyone knows everyone else's business, but it's also a place of darkness. And so there's this this the seek the secrets under the secrets and those are things that as it even says in this book some of these will be exposed by the end of this story some will never be some people will never never ever know about and it's an interesting just juxtaposition those those telephone lines of gossip versus the underbelly of darkness yeah i like that idea so we cut over to sandy mcdougall who is waking up on saturday morning but but something's wrong matt the the sun is too high in the sky. Her baby never would have slept that long, and um, this this is a this is a hard <laughs> hard part to read as a new parent. By the way, I think there's something so carnally terrifying about this entire sequence. I, I I had trouble reading it. I think everyone knows about SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, and like everyone when you're pregnant will tell you about SIDS over and over again and the precautions. And it's like they scare the shit out of you that like your baby could just suddenly die with no notice and it just terrifying and i think like the first few weeks of my son's life was like constantly checking on him every time he's sleeping just to be sure he's alive still and so the idea of like waking up in the morning and being like wait a minute it's way too late i i should have heard my baby by now like that's terrifying uh yeah um we use one of those movement sensing pads with all of our kids uh because i i, I had no interest in that shit mm -hmm. um uh, and by the way, there's there's a there's no age uh, at which you'll stop worrying if your kids are sleeping too late. Oh, so good, thanks. That's look forward to that. I can't wait. Um, of course, it is not sudden infant death syndrome. It's more sudden vampire eat baby syndrome. <laughs> uh huh. Um, we, we find that Randy isn't in his crib dead. He was quote flung into the corner like a piece of garbage. One leg stuck up grotesquely. Um, in an inverted exclamation point. That's awful. <laughs> it's, it's, uh -huh. it's, that was really hard for me to imagine. Like, I'm just, cause you, you, I think you immediately, if you're a parent, put the, you're, you're imagining your kid in that moment. And, huh, no, no. It's interesting because I kind of avoided visualizing. I it, could not. Which, uh, could not. Which I guess I didn't even realize I did until I, until I read this, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a touch that really emphasizes the in, the in, inhumanity of these vampires yeah. because, you know, to them, he's just food to, to be tossed aside when he's used up. Um, yeah. In fact, you could even go further and imagine that, that whatever vampire it was that went into his room um, and, you know, drank his tiny one baby's worth of blood in one go was like frustrated that it wasn't a very good meal and, and threw him aside in frustration or something like that. Yeah. I mean, none, none of this is textual, but it's like, well, this is the this is the only time we've seen a body like crumpled in the corner instead of just left lying in bed. Yeah, and I think this is. I think we know it's Danny Glick that is the one that yeah, did this. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're, you're right. We do know that. Just yeah. like, like I think you know, you were talking last week about the behavior of the vampires to really sell this idea that they are these true monsters. And here's here's another event here, right, where we have the kid vampire who maybe we could be like, okay, but he's just a child. Maybe he's okay. And no, no. No, no, the kid is is just as bad, if not if not worse, because he's right. the one that sought out this baby to to eat. Right? Yeah, he's. I mean, we haven't seen we haven't really seen much from the others, but yeah, he does he does seem to to lack any kind of um, restraint or or almost you could say common sense in terms of who he's picking to be his victims. Yeah, I think the greatest irony of the scene is, of course, that like all the other vampires before him, little Randy McDougal. Uh, looks perfectly alive and well as she finds him in the corner. He he's he has great color. Um, all the bruises from his repeated beatings from his mother are gone now. So uh, this uh, this really really bit of irony here that like he looks better than he did in life because the damages that she she had done to him are now gone. Um, it's yeah. it's really a twist of the knife there. Right, and then we spend this whole uh, extremely upsetting interlude where <sighs> she tries to feed him. And, and it plops out of his mouth. Oh, it's so yeah, it's, it's so hard to read, it's man. Very upsetting. Yeah. Yeah. I this just made me I know you don't know everything about about Pet Cemetery, but I'm I'm never reading that book again now that I've had a child. Never, uh -huh. never again. Not doing it. No way I could make it do that. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. So then we cut from the house of one dead kid to the house of two. 
Uh We're with Tony Glick and he's spending his day asleep, hiding from his grief. His wife is doing similar things, but, but for different reasons, Matt, she's, she's turning into a vampire. (laughs) Uh Uh, We have this line here. I look awful. She said, I know I looked at myself in the bathroom mirror before I went to bed last night and I hardly seemed to be there for a minute. I, a smile touched her lips. I thought I could see the tub behind me. Like there was only a little of myself left and it was oh so pale. So uh, this does a couple things simultaneously, right? It allows us to check another box on our vampire Laurel Rama, right? Where we know, okay, we got it. Uh, in this version of vampires, no reflections. Got it. Check. Um, but I think it's also just the, the language here is just a beautiful metaphor for what it must feel like to lose a child, right? Like I looked at myself in the mirror and I hardly seem to be there anymore. There was only a little of myself left. It's like my sons have died and I've, and, and, and most of me has died along with them. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I love this interlude because it humanizes what's happening to these people. Yeah. Um, it's, it's an, it's very, it's a very cool idea. I think to parallel the idea of fading away due to grief with the genre conceit of fading away because your soul is being eaten away by a vampire who also happens to be the dead child that you're grieving. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it, it's, it's just, a, it's such a clever, you know, use of existing genre tropes and concepts to, to actually root them in something very human and, and, and visceral. Yeah. I think, I think that's kind of a great place to kind of talk about, how the evil is spreading through this town, right? If we, st- if we take a step back and look at it, of course, everything starts with the arrival of Barlow and Straker. But if the vampires here serve as a larger metaphor for darkness, as we were talking about it before, then what, what really starts things rolling here is a tragedy, the death of a child and the k- disappearance of another, right? Um, and, and so if you look at it, just if you take the vampires out of the equation and you just look at the at small town reeling from the death of two children or the presumed death of two children, rather, it, it, it just becomes the catalyst for the collapsing of an entire town, like, like represented through Danny the vampire kind of flitting around town, eating people and turning them his how his death and the death of his brother kind of spreads rot and destruction and chaos and grief and collapse through a town that was already um you know on on shady ground because the ground beneath them is covered in darkness and secrets and and terrible terrible rocks that will catch your blade as you try to move through life yeah 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 once again sort of converting from genre supernatural stuff back to grounded reality yeah uh, we're observing the devastation of this tragedy traveling along the fault lines of the community. Mm-hmm. Um, except it's, you know, literally a vampire killing people. So. <laughs> it's a vampire fault line. It's yeah. a, it's a vamp quake. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so we cut over to the hospital with Ben Mears and Susan. They exchange. I love yous, Matt. So for tracking, uh, how, how well the Ben and Susan relationship is going, eh, they're just, they're just dropping that phrase now. Um, Yep. Been dating, what, a couple of weeks? Yep. Soon they're going to update Facebook. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Then Susan fills in Ben on some town gossip. Uh, But first, before they do that, they have to see how much of this they actually believe. Despite what she said at the end of last week's chapter, Matt, Susan's rational side has taken over a bit here, and she's not ready to fully accept what is going on. She says, yes, but I don't believe. Can't. Stop a minute. That word can't blocks up everything. That's where I was stuck. That absolute goddamn it, damned imperative word, can't. I didn't believe Matt, Susan, because such things can't be true, but I couldn't find a hole in a story any way I looked it. Um, this is, a, I think, a continuation of the conversation we had last week, right? Where where, where characters were like trying to process this the best they can and, and get it coming to the end of their ropes. And we have this line here. I haven't given up hope for rational explanation, Susan. I'm hoping for one, almost praying for one. Monsters in the movies are sort of fun, but the thought of them actually prowling through the night isn't fun at all. Yeah, um, I, I like that Ben just says plainly um, – that you know just just basically lays all that out plainly because i think that's a big part of what king is doing mm-hmm. with this book is he's he's grounding the horror he's making you really consider what this would feel like you know i, I think part of the reason we like horror movies is that it's a way of facing fear in a controlled setting mm-hmm, mm-hmm. where we know that we can't really be hurt and i think there's a risk that horror fiction can sometimes 
forget that we're supposed that 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 it is supposed to take itself seriously, even while it knows the viewer slash reader fundamentally can't take it seriously because because yeah. there's the, there's a dichotomy there. But but King is making it clear that his characters are taking this very seriously. I think that's yeah. a very important step here. I even like Susan's regression along this line too. I mean, we talked last week about how. You know, we had gotten to the end of that chapter and all three of our main characters are, are totally bought in now Like we had uh, Matt was uncertain, but he's in on it now. He's saying the word vampire Ben's experience with Floyd, as we'll learn here, specifically the fact that Floyd is acting like a vampire um, is the thing that convinces him. And then Susan, her experience in Matt's house kind of put her over the top, but not quite right. We see we see that Susan regressed a little bit here. And I think there's something natural to that. I think we saw it with, with Ben back uh, in, in last week's chapters as well, where you go through this thing. And, and I think he even says like, it sure feels more real in the darkness of night, right? That like when you're talking about the things that go bump in the night and you're, you're talking about them when you're in the night, it's, it's certainly much more easy to buy into and believe this stuff. But then you kind of come out into the cold light of day and your rational side takes over again. And that's basically what's happened to Susan at the start of this chapter. She's like, she had totally bought in and then she slept on it and was like, wait a minute. No, 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 this is ridiculous. Um, and I think it's, it, we see that thought process on both of them. And I think it's, it's a really natural one. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're exactly right. Yeah. So as we were talking about, Ben gets switches over to Floyd Tibbetts and the strange clothing he was wearing when he attacked Ben, the overcoat, the hat, the sunglasses. Uh, once again, just reiterating that you you got to it eventually, Matt. You were right on the mark with this one. Uh-huh. Um, we see here the sun was out. It was shining on him. And I don't think he liked that. Yeah, yeah. Everybody get to hear me figure that out in real time. So, <laughs> I think the thing that really gives it away is the gloves. Like he's wearing like rubber gloves and that just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, right. I mean, so I mean, what's great is if if you are slow on the uptake like I was, then it's just an utterly surreal moment where you're just like he gets out of the car and he's. Well, first of all, why is he in Ben's car? Second of all, why is he dressed like a maniac? Mm -hmm. And and then and then it's just it's just so it's just such a surreal moment. But then, of course, it makes total sense when you realize, oh, vampire. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And this is the fun of our our story whole format because i don't remember what i thought the first time i read this i have no idea yeah um but i get to relive it through you and and I, so i'm willing to bet i didn't connect the dots either right away i guess i'll just say like if you imagine this being done in, in, a, in a movie which i mean I, I guess there are adaptations it would be interesting to see how they do this because like mm-hmm. when you think of of you know a vampire going about it, their business in the daylight um you don't think about something as utterly goofy as like bright yellow gloves and <laughs> and 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 a a, a a fedora and and sunglasses like it's it's ridiculous right it's it's um it's absurd yeah and i think that, like like that's that's one of the ways in which it works so well is it's like it's such an absurd thing to to see that ben is just like stunned in place See, this is how I know you haven't watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer because you haven't seen a vampire drive a car in daylight with shoe polish over the windshield and big goggles on his head. I have not seen that. <laughs> maybe if if I don't remember if I had read this book originally before or after watching Buffy, but maybe I connected this immediately because I just imagined Spike driving a car in daylight, which is the most hilarious and kind of world breaking thing ever. But I don't even care. It's great. <laughs> uh huh. One day, Matt, one day I'll get to show you that. Okay. So speaking of Floyd, we cut over to good old Nolly finding him dead in the drunk tank of the prison. Um, I, I, this is like the interesting thing about what we're doing here, Matt, is we're kind of cutting to these random vignettes and then we're cutting back to Ben and Susan and to a lesser extent, Matt in this chapter, because he's mostly out for the count in this one. And every time we cut away from them, we cut to another vampire being created, right? And and so it really kind of starts to build and you start to get this feeling of things are spinning out of control because it's like, okay, so we we start the chapter off and then we've got, okay, uh, now there's a baby vampire. Oh, and now um, now Danny Glick's mom is a vampire too. And then we we cut over here and and now we know that Floyd Tibbetts is one as well. And then we'll cut somewhere else. And it, like it just, it really starts to just to accelerate the rate at which, oh, this town is being completely overrun. Right. It's, it's going exponential. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's some sort of vampire pyramid scheme. Yep, yep, exactly. I So I, I love Nolly being such a worthless cop, just like standing <laughs> there and yelling for Floyd to wake up for what I presume was like 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, smart enough to realize maybe I shouldn't walk into a cell with a vampire. I mean, he doesn't know it's a vampire yet, right. but but he, I mean... He's got good instincts, maybe. Yeah, uh, maybe. Yeah. Okay. I guess we can give him that much. I mean, if, in any other situation, this would make him a terrible cop. But in this, like, this one situation uh-huh. in which the guy just died because he's turning into a vampire, it was maybe the right move. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we'll see. Maybe, maybe uh, his cowardliness will save him in the end. <laughs> uh, so then we cut over to Franklin Bodens, uh, who, uh, if you recognize that last name, he's the uncle of Mark Petrie's Blager playground bully um and we see him and his friend virgil rathbun these are two blue collar workers who are taking their crappy as they call it down to the local dump um we're gonna spend some time talking about the wonderful creepiness of the scene because we know that the last time we left the dump um there was a vampire there about to turn the owner of the dump into one of his denizens Uh but before we get that how good are these guys right (laughs) it's it's hilarious it's an interesting kind of pressure valve scene at first it, it, the, the tension ramps up afterwards but the start of the scene is kind of this this two bumbling drunk morons the horace and jasper of salem's lot kind of um uh-huh. as they're just kind of idiots bumbling their way into this chore they have to do every so often like i love this part here where um it says all of them hunchbacks do franklin said wisely he spat out the window discovered it was closed and swiped his shirt sleeve across the scratched and cloudy glass <laughs> Just the juxtaposition of him saying something wisely and then immediately spitting on yeah. a closed window, which is already scratched and cloudy. Right. Like <laughs> already impossible to make that mistake. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, like you said, this is a comic relief interlude mm-hmm. to sort of because I mean, God, we started out with this high operatic tone and then yeah. we've seen a dead we've seen, baby. We've seen a dead baby. We've seen a, a, a grieving mother and husband with, with, with the wife dying. Yeah. And, and that, and so you just need a little, 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 relax a little bit, back off. Mm-hmm. We're gonna get back mm-hmm. to the horror soon, I'm sure. Um, and, I mean, we get right back to the horror, really, because these guys go to the dump, and it's yeah. a nightmare. Yeah. Speaking of that, um, they get to the dump. Of course, Dead Rogers is missing. Um, he hasn't burned or plowed any of the trash all week, and they go and notice that his shed was locked from the inside, and there's like a like a tarp over his window, and even if even if there wasn't a tarp over it, he couldn't have fit through that. Now with his hunchback, so where where could he be? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm supposed to have figured this out or something. But uh, I'm not telling I, you nothing. I just kind of figured he was hiding in there somewhere, which made it creepy. And, and then I thought more about it, and I was like, maybe like not knowing where he is is actually the scariest part of all this. Um, because uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because King is both playing. With some dramatic irony, we know that Dud is probably a vampire now, but it it, it he we don't know how he got out of the shed, right? right? Like there's the tarp over the window seems to be in place. The door was locked from the inside. Where could he be? We don't understand that yet. Yeah, just to kind of BS my way through something like if. If he was one of the few people who's actually been turned by Barlow directly, he, in fact, he's the only person that we know of who's been turned by Barlow directly at this point in time. Yeah. For a certainty. Maybe he's just like, a, a he can do things that other vampires can't do. Yeah. This would be um, a time where it would really pay off for you to remember the three types of vampires, Matt, yeah, that you've and, totally forgotten. And what they can and can't do, right? Yeah. I keep wondering if useful. I should bring this information up, and I, I think I'm just going to not because it's more fun this way. It is more fun. And, and I guess it never really, I, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll figure, it'll be more fun to figure it out and, and then, you know, remember it. It's not that I don't remember anything. It's just that I, it's just sure. that I know I, I know that mostly Callahan was hunting like the weaker form, right? Yes, so, yes. I mean, it um, can't like it can't pay off in any kind of super satisfying way because King had not made up these three types when he wrote this book. Like he just hadn't done that yet. Right. And so the most it can be is a kind of retroactive explanation for some stuff in this book. That's like the right. most it could ever possibly be. But it's just it's fun to to tease you knowing I, I do remember the three types of vampires. Exactly. Yep. Uh, I I really like this scene as well. Um, this little little bit at the end of this whole vignette, 
They walked back to the truck, and Franklin felt something seeping through the protective membrane of drunkenness, something he would not remember later, or want to. A creeping feeling. A feeling that something here had gone terribly awry. It was as if, as if the dump had gained a heartbeat, and the beat was slow yet full of terrible vitality. He suddenly wanted to go away, very quickly. I don't see any rats, Virgil said, suddenly. So you eat all the rats? I don't know. Where'd the rats go? There were so many rats. There were more yeah. rats than he could ever kill, and now they're all gone. Where'd they all go? I know. It's creepy. It's the unknown. Yeah. I mean, but to, to circle back to some of our earlier conversation, like, we once again have a character, Franklin. We, we did not mention that both Franklin and Virgil are, like, extremely drunk. And there it goes back to your conversation about how Salem's Lot becomes just a metaphor metaphor for alcoholism um, as, as something seeps through the protective membrane of drunkenness. Yeah. It's perfect. Right. That's, what an interesting idea there because it's almost like, hey, if if they hadn't been drunk, if they had been present, then they would have noticed that something was terribly amiss. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe they could have potentially acted on that knowledge. Mm-hmm. But but no, they're they're drunk. They're not present. They're uh, they're, uh, uh, you know, sedating themselves, mm-hmm. basically. And and they're going to miss the opportunity to notice this and then they're going to get eaten later. <laughs> and then, of course, I love I just love the idea of like that we've, we've talked about the Marston house feeling feeling like this thing that was alive. And now in this in this drunken moment, Franklin and Virgil both feel that the dump has gained its own sense of terrible vitality as well. It's just I love it. I love it. so yeah, much. I, I like that. Yeah. We briefly cut back to Ben as he heads up to visit old Matt. And all that happens right here is that he puts a cross around Matt's neck. And I just, I, I, this is why I made fun of it in the opening joke is that yeah. the nurse sees him do this and says, is he Catholic? He is now, Ben said somberly. Um, but I mean, I, it, it's, it's a fun kind of beat. But it's also, we could dive into this if we wanted to, because like that starts to get into what belief is, right? Like this is something we know that we're the one thing you do remember happens in this book from wolves of the Cala is that there is going to be a confrontation with father Callahan and Barlow. We know this is going to happen. We know that Callahan is going to be found without a sufficient belief or faith to make it through the encounter unfazed. And so just the idea of the power of belief kind of showing up in different places throughout the course of the story makes that stick out to me no, that we come in here knowing more than we would have normally. Um, so I like my, my eyes and are picking up on these moments of belief more than they normally would be. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I, I don't know if you can hear that it's hailing really hard here. I did. Hear, I did hear some noises. Yeah. yeah. I just thought you were like rummaging around and stuff. No, no, no. I thought it was a vampire. Really I thought it was a vampire knocking on your window. You're talking about signs of faith and then it started <laughs> hailing. So, um, uh, now I'm really distracted thinking about my car getting impounded. But anyway, um, the, uh, uh, I, I, I totally, I totally agree because like if, if the reason you become a Catholic is because of vampires, <laughs> then I don't know if that's quite following the rules. Yeah. I mean, um, like this idea, this idea in that's so prevalent in Christianity and in, in other religions as well. It's just Christianity is the one I have the most intimate knowledge with is that faith. The point of faith is that you don't have a physical proof of something is that you, you believe regardless. And so to, to, to gain belief just because the, the evil is standing in front of you or because God appears in front of you and says, here, take this, take this rosary right. and fight that vampire is not really what faith is supposed to be about. But um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't have power. And I think one of the things I want to pay attention to is King's evolving um, opinions on, on belief and on totems. I think we talked about like, in when we when we read over the section in um the dark tower in uh wolves of the Kala, we kind of talked about how part of callahan's arc in those stories is to recognize that the symbol is is just a symbol it does not have any innate power to it it's powered by your beliefs and i'm wondering and we we don't know for sure but i'm wondering if that's an evolution of a a feeling that king hadn't fully articulated in his head yet right where we kind of have seen 
so far in the story. I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but the symbols themselves, the crosses themselves seem to be infused with some sort of innate power. Um, I mean, it se- it seems that way, although you could you could read it as, well, they have that power because people expect them to. Sure, sure. Um, which is sort of a looser form of the idea that your faith in, in you know, the power of goodness is, is what's required to fight the darkness. Um, I don't know. I, I agree that it, that this doesn't seem quite like what we, uh, we, what we end up seeing in the dark tower. It does yeah. seem like he, he sort of evolved in his thinking between now and then. Sure. I, I think that's just something worthy to, to think about as we move into this. Um, also worth pointing out that you cannot in fact become a Catholic just because a man who is not a Catholic puts a cross around your neck oh my god it's a huge pain in the ass it's a huge pain in the ass. it's one of those things that like i was born into catholicism and then i looked at the people having to go through the work to like convert and i was like who <laughs> i got i went in the easy way <laughs> uh-huh. it's a lot of work it's a lot um, of work although i was told that if if you ever found anyone who was dying and they said, like, oh, I didn't get to convert to Catholicism, which was my one wish, then you could baptize them in that moment and that, that would count. Interesting. And you would have saved their soul. Interesting. Right, so that's not a- what any, this is. Any though. human being could do that. It doesn't have to be an ordained priest. I think like- it has to be. I, I don't remember if you have to be a Catholic to do it or not. I think it was. It, it very much seemed like a magical power that you had as a Catholic, though. So I thought that was cool. I definitely, I love definitely something that powers. stuck with me forever. Yeah, right. Um, I don't know if I don't really know if this is true. This is just what <laughs> I was told in like in like confirmation. Uh, I was I don't remember being told that, but uh, I, I believe you. It actually, seems like it seems like a Catholic thing. It might have been a power that I that I gained by going through confirmation. Oh yeah, we did gain a lot of powers when we did that. Yeah, yeah. So zooming right along. <laughs> Uh, we catch up with Bonnie Sawyer and her sordid love affair with a young Corey Bryant. They are at it again, Matt, and Bonnie Sawyer tries to, like, I don't know, awkwardly turn this encounter into a porno. <laughs> she's uh-huh. like she's like really into this whole Mr. Telephone Man role play thing. <laughs> oh, it's so fun. It is really fun. I wonder, did you like get before reggie sawyer showed up were you like oh this is the time when her husband's definitely gonna be there i mean i figured something was going to go terribly wrong this time yes sure. I, I didn't i didn't necessarily think that, that it was going to be the husband because i mean i frankly assumed it was going to be something vampire related which i was only partially wrong about because yeah. there is a vampire but yeah. that's not until a little bit later yeah so reggie sawyer is here he came home and caught the two of them in the act and he's got a shotgun I, I think the tension of the scene is really, really great, Matt. I think, you know, King is always willing to go there and there being anywhere. <laughs> and so uh, when he's when he shows his willingness to go to these incredibly dark, uncomfortable places, you get a scene like this where you truly don't know what's going to happen. Like it, it would not be beyond the pale for King to have Reggie brutally murder both of these people and have no no bad feelings about it at all he could have done anything to them he could have tortured them first like it it is it is fully within king's ability to do something this dark and i think that allows the scene to be stuffed with tension with the tension of of truly anything can happen and it makes you feel what it must have been like to be bonnie and Corey in this scene living this moment where he's just there with the gun and you don't know what's going to happen yeah right um, I, I mean, I, I think I think part of that is like the choice to have Reggie just smiling calmly the whole time is, is far more unnerving than if he had been furious and raving mm-hmm. because you can really believe that he he could just he could just kill them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, when, when he when he makes when he makes um, uh, Corey put the gun in his mouth and then pulls the trigger, oh I was like, oh, he killed him. Yeah. But then it's like, oh, no, it was unloaded. And he just he just faints. Which is actually kind of funny. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, and it goes to, like, it's of course he punishes his wife and not Corey because it's her fault, not his. You know, he just he yeah. just mentally fucks with him and he like horribly abuses his wife, um, which is just a classic. It's a classic Reggie Sawyer move. It's a classic thing that you would you would just abuse the shit out of your wife and then let this guy go. Um, 
right? I mean, he, he seems like a sadist in, in this moment. Basically. Yeah. Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, but as we said, Reggie ends up sparing Corey, um, and Corey escapes, told that he can never come back to the town again. He has to leave, and he's going to. But a few feet down the road, he comes back in contact with a strange foreign man. This is Mr. Barlow, Matt. Here he is. And he's ready to have a, a new friend. Yay, friends. He's going to help him. <laughs> yeah, he's going to help him. With his uh, problem. I, I want to read this whole thing to you because it's delightful. Names, he said. Oh, the American insistence on names. Let me sell you an automobile because I am Bill Smith. Eat this. Eat at this one. Watch that one on television. My name is Barlow, if that eases you. And he bursts into laughter again, his eyes twinkling and shining. Corey felt a smile creep onto his own lips and could scarcely believe it. His troubles seemed distant, unimportant in comparison to the derisive good humor on those dark eyes. You're a foreigner, aren't you? Corey asked. I am from many lands, but to me, this country, this town seems full of foreigners. You see? Eh? Eh? He burst into that full-throated crow of laughter again, and this time Corey found himself joining in. The laughter escaped his throat under full pressure, rising a bit with delayed hysteria. <laughs> it's interesting the ways in which the book has used like hysterical laughing and crying and screaming as like a way of indicating uh, the darkness and the evil. That's you know like. It, like we had it, we yeah. had that last week we had Susan like, and Ben on the point of hysterical laughter at different points. Um, and this is of course, hysterical laughter brought on by Barlow's ability to kind of hypnotize people. But it, it's interesting. We have this kind of recurring beat of this hysterical laughter. Yeah. Well, it's, it's this idea of like suppressed, powerful emotions below the surface that are never, you know, always in danger of coming out, but the people keep, keep them on lock. Yeah. Until, you know, until there's an actual vampire there and then the hysterical mm -hmm. laughter finally comes forth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it, I love his joke, too. It's yeah. like he there's no way Corey gets what he's saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, I, I mean, Barlow, Barlow is way more fun than I expected. Actually, sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's a full he's a full on character. Like he's mm -hmm, not just being mm -hmm. creepy. He's he's. He, he's, he, I mean, as we go more into this, like he keeps talking, he seems to have like a philosophy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He's not just, a mo he's not, I mean, he's a monster, but he's not just like feeding. He's no, doing he's this got, for reasons. Yeah, he's got a mission. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he starts to monologue here and he first tells us why he loves this country, America. These people have never known hunger or want, and the more they get, the more aggressive they become, which is a contradiction, he says. In, in his lands, when people get too much, they just get fat. But in this land, the more they get, the more they want, and the more aggressive they are to get it. And this is when I wanted to kind of talk, circle back around to the conversation at the beginning. I think it is interesting to compare this outlook on the town with the one that opened this chapter. Um, like – like we said at the beginning that the you the quote unquote you in the opening felt desperate felt bar barely hanging on felt true suffering and want and, and and barlow describes america as this place of unlimited excess that i'm sure many people experience but it doesn't seem like there's a lot of excess in this town yeah well i mean i, I don't, yeah i don't i don't quite know where, where, what to do with this yet because i mean obviously there's certain people um, like uh, Crockett, um, the the real estate guy—that's mm -hmm. his name, right? Who who does have more than he needs, and that just makes him more aggressive. But like, that's just like one guy in in, yeah. the, in the town that that really fits that description. Sure. Um. I, but I, yeah. But I mean, the, I mean, the interesting. <laughs> if you look at the scene as it's unfolding here, what has just happened? It's, it's Corey and Bonnie were having an affair. So it's right. literally a woman who had something and then wanted more. And so it started this affair. And so like it is, there, there seems to be like a more generally like this desire of the people to want more things. Um, and, and, and so far Barlow and Straker have abused that want constantly. That's how they got their foothold in. That's how they got the Marston house was to play off of Crockett's, uh, greed. That's how, I mean, he doesn't need to convince Corey here that, that he wants to get his revenge and, and get, get back on the other people. But like, he, that's the way he goes, which is so interesting, right? He could just like run up and bite him and then you're mine now. But it's like, 
it's part of his understanding that he he plays off of the greed of these people yeah right he's he is preying on on you know basically amplifying this darkness that already exists Mm -hmm. He, he doesn't just want to to feed on this guy um he he's seeking something in Salem's lot, something specific. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting thought that occurs to me is, is, is there not some similarity in terms of what Barlow is seeking with relative to what Ben is seeking by returning to Salem's lot? Interesting. Um, like both, both of them, both of them want something out of this town. Um, yeah. And, and, it, and it's almost like what Barlow wants is like the dark, the dark mirror of what Ben wants. Be, whereas Ben is sort of in denial about the nature of the town, actually. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, like, it, it, I think the mirror is the right word because, yeah, there's, there's, Ben is grasping for the nostalgia of, the, of the the way that nostalgia pushes the darkness away and and shows only the light side. Barlow is is there to embrace that exact thing that that Ben is not quite willing to deal with yet. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could even say that that Ben, his memories only only recall the positive aspects. You could even say the alcoholic aspects. Sure, where, sure. Where where you're you're numbing you're numbing and, and pushing away all of the problems in this in this haze, this protective fog yeah. um, of nostalgia, and that's why Ben comes back. Not only is he an alcoholic, he's a townaholic. He 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 wants to he wants to forget his troubles by by you know marinating in what he sees as this place it's just gonna get, get, gonna make him feel better um, yeah town right, holic, is, i love that yeah but 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 barlow is like yeah no nah, man <laughs> barlow and striker are opening a, a bar in the alcoholic town basically yes yeah i like that they, they yeah they're they're serving to play off of that exact alcoholic tendency both literally and figuratively yeah yeah i, I, I love that um so, yeah go ahead um, I was just wondering if there was something we could say about the fact that they opened an antique store, like they're selling very old things. Yeah, I mean, it certainly is a like a, a look back on the the quality of the old, right? Um, the yeah. like the desire, like an antique is something that is valuable because it is old. Um, yeah, right, right. I, I don't, I didn't, I didn't necessarily have anywhere to go with that. I was just sure wondering. Yeah. So Barlow talks about how he would have gone to a city, but they're they're too big, they're too loud, too urban. Um, he jokes about how he'd probably get hit by a car, which is a direct quote to what uh, King's wife Tab- Tabitha said if he put Dracula in a modern day city that she'd probably get hit by a cab. So that's him kind of putting her her little quip into his book, which is adorable. Yeah, um, I love it. So he says here, so I have come here. To a town which was first told of me by a most brilliant man, a former townsman himself, now lamentably deceased. The folk here are still rich and full-blooded, folk who are stuffed with the aggression and darkness so necessary to... There is no English for it. Pokol? Verdlak? Ialak? Do you follow? Yes, Cory whispered. The people have not cut off the vitality which flows from their mother, the earth, with a shell of concrete and cement. Their hands are plunged into the very waters of life. They have ripped the life from the earth whole and beating is it not true so we got to talk about this for a while yeah um so i of course had to try to figure out what pokol verdulak iliac means <laughs> um which by the way don't really have definitions that i could find and also i was no. kind of like squinting my eyes because i didn't want to see spoilers um <laughs> but but it, it it seems to they all seem to vaguely have either connotations or meanings that mean something in the vicinity of like supernatural evil. Yeah, um, yeah. They, they, I, they, I, think, they have, I think some of them are just like malformations of Slavic words for vampire. Yeah, so some of them. Some of them are like like vampire, werewolf, hell, witch, something <laughs> like that. Or if I may be so bold, Discordia. Oh, ho, 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 ho. look at you go. <laughs> No, I think um, I think you're onto something there. But, yeah. but but it works, right? If you just replace the if, if you replace what he said, if you if you say, you know, the, the the folk are stuffed with the aggression and darkness so necessary to supernatural evil. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that that works for me. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's interesting, right? Because what he's saying here is that, like, I Barlow vampire could not just post up in any town in this country, like. 
I, I need a certain place. I need a certain type of people. I need this people and this land, right? We go back to the land. Um, you know, we say that a town is three things, right? The people, the buildings and the land. And we get the, the people here that are a certain amount of aggression and darkness. So necessary to the, the discordia. We get um, people who have not cut, not cut off the vitality with a shell of concrete and cement. So their buildings are a little bit different. And so they have access to the land, to the very waters of life. Um, it, it's an interesting idea, right? That this, what, what darkness needs to spread in this case is this kind of small town environment, which I mean, it's interesting because it's, it's not like, it's not like King is saying here that darkness doesn't exist in cities, that there's not like bad evil things that happen in cities, but it's this very old ancient kind of evil yeah. that can only exist in these places. Yeah. It's, it's, it's connected to the earth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. Which it, it makes you feel like, his goal maybe barlow doesn't even feed on blood maybe he just feeds on you know murder and and sure. and, and evil like like you know recrimination and, and vengeance yeah. and and violence between people like maybe he's just sitting there you know he he drinking in the the sorrow that he's caused with his yeah. Um, you know, with these, with these things that he started. Yeah. And to kind of go back to Bram Stoker's Dracula, we talked about the very beginning that that is a book kind of where, where Stoker is kind of ruminating on the power of technology and, and the power of understanding and science and, and forensics and, and all these new ideas at the turn of the century that would allow modern day people at the time to defeat the unknowable to defeat this the same kind of to defeat the the discordia right that and and in that story that they win right um what this book is then saying is okay so that stuff definitely came to pass but there are places in this world in which none of that happens in which everything remains the same nothing changes everything is stalled time doesn't really pass and in those places, evil can fester and grow and and flourish. And that's what's happening here. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Cool. So Barlow then tells Corey, he doesn't want to leave Salem's Lot. Of course you don't. You don't want to leave. You're never going to leave the lot. And we'll actually help you get revenge on those who have filled themselves while others want. Um, which is a great, a great line. <laughs> yeah. From from a vampire, yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so this, uh, this was an opportunity to mention something I've been thinking about, which is just like, you know, by the end of this week, we'll, you will see, right. Yeah. I mean that, that, okay. Yeah. Anyway, Barlow has gone after two specific people that we know of Dud mm-hmm. Rogers and Reggie here. Um, and all the other vampires that we've seen seem to have been part of a chain that started with Danny Glick. We don't know whether it was Barlow or Straker who who bit Danny Glick. So in other words, um Barlow's not getting any sustenance from all of Danny Glick's victims. Sure. Um unless it's a sort of indirect magical sustenance. <laughs> um so 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 I think we already hit upon this a couple times actually, but like yeah, he's not just hungry. He's not just here to eat all of these people. He I think he wants to or maybe even needs to watch the town eat itself alive. That's that's what he's here for. Yeah. And a, a needful things kind of situation. Uh, yeah. I mean, I was avoiding hammering too hard on, on that because. Because I, I think it's distinct enough. That I didn't want to just be like, oh, King's doing the needful things thing again. I mean, he is and he isn't right. I think there yeah. are parts of this that line up and there are parts of it that are slightly different. He's he's exploring a different aspect of these towns, but it it is similar. I mean, like yeah. if you look at Dud Rogers and at uh, at Corey here, you you see two people that he kind of swoops amongst them in their time of um anger confusion and uh, being ostracized from the town right like dud he like manipulates dud immediately and says like oh you're the the humpback that no one likes and so like we're we're gonna fix that you'll get the girl you want even though she's a high school 
teenager dud uh-huh. Jesus. And then of course, Corey is like, no, 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 you were the wronged one, even though you were participating in a, in a affair. Um, they don't understand you and you should, you should get your revenge on the people that have harmed you. It's like, he's finding these people in their moments of weakness and, and, um, you know, feeding on them, feeding on that weakness. And yeah, yeah I mean, so far, Danny Glick seems to just be kind of like, just flying around <laughs> just eating whoever he wants i right. mean i guess you could argue the same thing like glick goes after randy mcdougall the little baby who is in a moment of terrible struggle and weakness where he's being beaten he's a, a six-month-old baby being abused regularly yeah I, I guess yeah i mean he 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 goes after his own mother who he knows will be susceptible to him he yeah. goes after Mike, yeah, I mean, Mike is almost a person of convenience that he was just like there when when Danny woke up. Right. But then I'm trying to and then like Mark. Mark is just somebody he he happens to know. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, we I haven't got there I, yet, but yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know if I've quite figured out the the exact sort of metaphysical underpinnings of their motivations. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. So back with Ben again, as the events of the town keep getting worse, Susan calls him on the phone to inform him that, oh, uh, Floyd Tibbetts and Randy McDougall are dead. And oh, yeah, Mike Ryerson and his body is now missing. And Carl Foreman, uh, the morgue attendant, he's he's gone now, too. And I I love that. I love that Ben is basically like, okay, that's it. (laughs) That's it. I believe this this is happening now. We have to accept this is happening now. Um, Yeah. And he also says this, which I thought was interesting. And both Matt and I, the crackpots, just happened to be out of town and out of action, Ben said, more to himself than Susan, almost as if it were planned. Yeah. Because we kind of, I think we kind of poked at that last week, but we didn't say it as directly because I, I knew this line was coming up. But I mean, do you think that that was like intentional that um, Mike Ryerson was sent to take out Matt and and uh floyd tibbetts was sent to take out ben to kind of like like in some way barlow knew that these two people were going to be part of what stood against him in this town and he needed to take them out i mean in this moment i I don't really like i don't think it's that premeditated but maybe i'm wrong i mean i i maybe barlow is way more like like you know mastermindy than than i'm than i'm thinking like i i just think that he's that he's exploiting everyone's you know uh venal uh, weaknesses mm-hmm. and selfishness and 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 t- tendencies toward violence and it just so happens that you know to, through through bad luck that happens to have uh, uh, backfired on on you know these two these two good characters um, yeah but, but I mean the fact that Ben's mentioning it as a possibility I guess should make us seriously consider it though yeah I think it's um it's interesting because it, like you're absolutely right that Floyd Tibbetts was a man who we said probably wasn't going to be the jealous boyfriend. That's going to beat up the new guy type. And he ended up being that, but it was only because of the vampirism. So yeah, it's like you're taking this person and you're putting, you're putting a little more strain on them in, in that they're turning into a vampire and they just are pushed into the violent a little bit more. And then Mike just literally was returning to the house that he died at. Um, he even like lays back down in bed or something as if he's just like not even exactly sure what he's right. doing. But do we, do we know who bit Floyd? I mean, that's, we don't know that because no. that's, that, that's an interesting question actually. No, um, um, they have not told us that. All right. Um, so, so there's a, the, the, the bit that you were just, just reading by the way, where Ben muses on whether or not it was planned. Um, that goes on a little bit because Susan says, Ben, I still don't believe this. A maniac, maybe someone who thinks he's a vampire, but believe what you want that make it cross. Um, so I want to pull that out because I don't know if it's the voice acting or what here, but I really have this impression at this point in the book that Ben has been rather rude and pushy and, and dismissive towards Susan. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I get that the situation is dire and maybe he, you know, feels like it's justified here, but like to me, it, it calls back to his, you know, eat your ice cream sure. from, from last week where like, it's a very specific way of talking down to her, talking over her, not really valuing her opinion on things. And 
I, I guess I'm just wanting to see if you get the same impression or if maybe this is some kind of specific artifact of, of doing the audiobook. I, I, I have not, I mean, not every time when I see them interact, but you're right. I mean, like one of the first interactions they have, you know, we talked about that at the time where he, she basically says, Oh, you know, I'd love to go to New York city. Um, I'd love to move there and, and start, you know, doing my art. And he basically lectures her on the proper way to move to New York city, having known her for all of three minutes. Um, he, he does talk to her in a very specific kind of way where I, I don't know. I, like, I don't know if this is, if I want, like, I, I don't want to put anything on the author. I wonder if King is conscious of this. I think, I think I want to say yes, like he's doing this intentionally, but I just don't know where to put it yet. I, I think you're picking up on something that is absolutely there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, he, the, the, and the thing that I just read out, I didn't read it as such, but sh she says, but, and then there's an M dash and then he says, believe what you want. So he, he's talking over her. Mm -hmm. He's interrupting her. He's, I, I mean, I, I just think like he sees her as being young and inexperienced. Yeah. And, and that's in, in this character's mind that justifies him just kind of, in, in a sort of patriarchal way, just being like, you don't know what's best for you. I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to tell you what, what to do. And I mean, we know he's older than her and we know that when he first saw her, he pegged her seven years younger than she actually was. So I think that that is a pretty good window into how she, he sees her for sure. Right. And I mean, the other thing is he was in the same place she is now a day ago and he's just had a little bit more time to process and come to an accepting and he's not giving her the space to do it like he's like it is interesting when you read the the whole conversation about can't is like get that don't get that stupid word out of it like that's what you were saying literally 12 hours ago and then you went through an experience and it's rewrited yourself you got to give her time to catch up to you yeah you know i haven't actually read through what people's answers to the discussion question are going to be but i feel like most people are not going to answer um that the way to get me to believe in something supernatural is to browbeat me <laughs> Because that's sure. kind of his approach, right? Right? It's yeah, like, yeah. It's like no, like like nothing he says is actually all that persuasive. It's it's more, it's it's nothing that would persuade me certainly. Yeah, it's it's basically like, well, I can't find a rational explanation for it. Ergo, yeah. it must be. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I also think like going back to our conversation about belief and Father Callahan, that that conversation we know is coming. If it is true that the symbols have no power except that which you put into it then the statement believe what you want but make the cross is a incredibly dangerous statement right That's a good point. like if you do not actually believe the cross won't do anything for you i like that yeah that's great yeah, but i mean again we don't we don't know for sure which side of this coin king is going to land on here about, about we'll the see. actual power of these things right right yeah, yeah we have seen that the people that have used them successfully matt in uh the, his his interaction with mike ryerson and then uh, uh mark petrie in a, in a minute here both fully buy into the vampire thing when the cross works so it right. seems like they have they have the belief but we haven't seen like if susan holds up a cross and she has still hasn't bought it and it burns a vampire then okay then then we have some understanding there right right we'll just have to perform that experiment yeah yeah <laughs> So they make a plan to meet up the next morning, fill in Matt, and then contact Dr. Cody. So they're recruiting one more to the Vampire Slaying Quartet here, Dr. Cody, who we just love. We love Dr. Cody. He's my favorite. Yeah. So meanwhile, both Floyd Tibbetts and Liddy, little baby McDougal escape from the morgue. <laughs> Such a great little horror scene. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. What does the INF next to the tag mean? Infant. Oh, no. <laughs> Just imagine what a vampire baby looks like. So yeah. is is Vampire Floyd like holding vampire baby or is vampire baby floating like we know vampires can float? I, I assume he's just floating around. That's amazing. And and just looking for anybody to bite. He's definitely gonna go bite his mom. Like if you're a vampire infant that's been abused by your mom, where are you gonna go first? Oh, I'm gonna go bite my mom. For does, sure. it, does a vampire infant have the mental capacity of an adult? Um, so, so that this is something I was actually thinking about, like, like, is this, <laughs> is this, is this vampire just going to start like floating through the streets, like just through the main thoroughfares and just like attack people in broad, in, 
not broad daylight because because I think it would at least have the wherewithal to notice that it was in pain. Mm-hmm. But, can, can a vampire baby get smarter and get better coordination and stuff? Like I'm telling you right now, my son's just almost three months old. You turn him into a vampire. You're fine. He's not going to be able to do anything to you. I'm just imagining like the baby tries to bite you and it's just gums because the teeth yeah, haven't come no in. Teeth. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, like, I don't know. Like imagine being stuck inside a body as a vampire for eternity where you like understand what's going on, but haven't, haven't gained uh understanding of use of your arms and legs yet. Uh huh. That would not be fun. I'm I'm kind of assuming that we'll that we'll see something of this vampire baby at some point. We but, might. Uh, you don't know. Yeah. I don't know. All right. So then we move on to the final scene of the chapter. And um everyone who has watched the Salem's Lot adaptation probably remembers the scene. It's the most famous scene from that movie. Mark Petrie awake awakens late at night. He looks out his window and who does he see? But Danny Glick floating there, begging to be let in. I love this part. It was only then he realized fright was too mild a word for this. Even terror did not express what he felt. The pallid face outside the window tried to smile, but it had lain in darkness too long to remember precisely how. What Mark saw was a twitching grimace, a bloody mask of tragedy. Yet, if you looked in the eyes, it wasn't so bad. I love that little beat about like trying to smile but not remembering how. Yeah. It's really right. Which is another thing to emphasize the inhuman. You know, it, it's not really Danny Glick anymore. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So Mark Petrie uses his knowledge of vampires to an advantage here. Knowing that their eyes were used to hypnotize, he starts random sayings like he thrusts his fists against the post and still insists he sees the ghosts and other ones that maybe you recognize, Matt. I don't know. Um, I, I See, for a second there, I thought you were just going to completely skip over the fact that he, he says the rain in Spain falls mainly on the plane. Well, no, see, I was doing a thing where I was letting you bring up the one you knew yeah, about. And you. I was thank I you. was slyly pointing out the other one which is from a different stephen king book that oh, we'll read one day that I, you don't I even see. know about yet yeah so you're doing you're you're just another level above me i am i am so many levels above you on the tower right now yeah, um, i guess so um yeah obviously uh he's uh he's in t- telepathic communication with roland to in the yeah. scene is what's happening there right you here. go there you go um, so as he manages to look away from the eyes and distract himself with these um, uh, tongue twisters, Mark Petrie still is walking towards the window. But on his way, he looks down at his model of universal monsters and he sees a gravestone that looks like a cross and he picks it up. And we see this with no pause for thought or consideration. Both would have come to an adult, his father, for instance, and both would have undone him. Mark swept up the cross, curled it into a tight fist and said loudly, come on in then. <laughs> so this is awesome, right? Um, I, I, there's there's tons to talk about here. I mean, just Mark's hyper competence that we saw when he was introduced, when he beat up a bully is paying off here in his first encounter with a vampire. Um, and then I also want to point out like the the point again, where we're talking about the way a child succeeds in this instance where an adult would have failed, like because he doesn't consider he doesn't doubt he just accepts and knows and goes like like we've had now three chapters in which matt and mike and uh, or sorry matt and ben and susan have all continuously doubted and tried to deny and refuse the the plain fact in front of them and mark petrie's over here just like oh yeah vampire (laughs) right yeah i know what to do here Yeah. yeah i mean his sheer gunslingerly bravery really seems to be what saves him Mm -hmm. what gives him an edge over the evil yeah Um, yeah and and of course as king points out rather explicitly uh in a moment there's an advantage that comes in lying between childhood and adulthood yeah because you have the credulity and familiarity with unknown terrors it comes with childhood but you also have some of the quick quick wittedness and self-control of adulthood um and and mark is remarkably self-possessed as a person as well that's been noted upon yeah. Um, so he's just sort of going to be the most useful person in the whole quartet by far. <laughs> and uh, of course, it, it works. And um, Danny Glick's face burns, and he retreats. And I mean, this is this is important, right? This is we have this. This chapter is basically interlude after interlude after interlude of a vampire 
winning, right? Every single one of these times, vampire wins, new vampire, vampire wins, new vampire. And then we get this one at the end of the chapter where for the first time, our human stands up and and beats back the vampire. And so there's there's a little hope here, a little hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to represent that hope, we have, for a moment, the cross shone with a fierce light as if the inner wire had been ignited. Then it dwindled away, leaving only a blue after image in front of his eyes. It's the white. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, what do you think here? Because obviously this could have just been infused with his belief, but it, it, it the symbol has clearly has power here. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. If, if he had had a turtle on his desk, <laughs> just a random example, and picked it up and, and used that as his talisman, just just believing in the power of of good to triumph over evil you know does that work Mm -hmm. and and i don't know maybe yeah um yeah i i I honestly still i'm I'm still not sure that i've nailed all this down because like the (laughs) skullpata that callahan uses is a super magical (laughs) skullpata sure like like so even that scene isn't like I guess he does cast it aside, right? Yeah, yeah, um, he does. Well, anyway. I mean, I guess the question here is, is it like, if if it is just a, a, a the power of belief in the white and the power that lies inside all goodness in the world, is it enough to beat back the darkness? Does it have to be a cross, right? Like, I think... Wolves of the Kala says no, but is this book going to say yes? And I yeah, keep I saying Wolves of the Kala. It's technically Song of Susanna in which that in which true. Callahan's um, and actually, no, it's the Dark Tower. Jesus, I'm all over the place in which yeah. that series concludes that. No, the symbol matters less than the person who is is putting their belief into it. Yeah, I mean, like you said, I think we'll just have to keep paying attention to see what King actually claims within this book sure sure all right so mark's parents come to check on him they hear a noise but he's fine and we get this this wonderful line that i want to conclude this week's reading on before drifting away entirely he found himself reflecting not for the first time on the peculiarity of adults they took laxatives liquor or sleeping pills to drive away their terrors so that sleep would come and their terrors were so tame and domestic the job, the money, what the teacher will think if I can't get Jenner, Jenny nicer clothes. Does my wife still love me? Who are my friends? They were pallid compared to the fears every child lies cheek and jowl within his dark bed with no one to confess to in hope of perfect understanding but another child. There is no group therapy or psychiatric or community social services for the child who must cope with the thing under the bed or in the cellar every night, the thing which leers and capers and threatens just beyond the point where vision will reach. The same lonely battle must be fought night after night, and the only cure is the eventual ossification of the imaginary faculties, and this is called adulthood. I love this whole thing. That's uh, that's fascinating. It's it's very fascinating because it's sort of Stephen King confessing to the fact that he was a very terrified child. Yes. Um, but obviously Stephen King's imaginative faculties never ossified. <laughs> um or I, I think I get what he means, though. You know, they yeah. they come under your control instead of being something that just operates completely without your oversight. Yeah, and I mean, I think this also serves to circle all the way back around to the very beginning of the chapter, right? Um, to this idea of the town as al- as an alco- like alcoholism, right? And like these people, you go back to this idea of darkness and and what is darkness but a place where unknown things can be and how we fear that, how we fear the unknown. And so what do adults do? What do people do when faced with that darkness? They took laxatives, liquor, or sleeping pills to drive away their terrors so that they can rest easy in that darkness. Um, and what are their terrors? They are things, the job, the money, you know, what the, 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 my plow getting caught on the rocks, these things that to a child feel so, insignificant and unimportant compared to the the great big evils of the world right yeah yeah it's it's very interesting Mm -hmm. um i i kind of hope next week we 
we get some more meat for our uh, discussion about about the, the themes because I think that was really fruitful today. Yeah, I totally agree. It, it's really fascinating. I love what this book is is saying. I, I mean, we obviously haven't come to a conclusion on it yet, and that's because the book has not come to a conclusion. But right. uh, plenty of opportunities to talk about this in the chapters to come. Yep. And that's going to do it for us this week with our reading. Um, Dark Tower Connections, I, you know, I, I, we put the section in here, but then like, I think we just kind of talk about them as we go through the chapter. So yeah. I, don't, I don't know if there's a necessity for a section here. Yeah, I I, I don't know. It, we, we can keep the session and and just be like, set this aside as our like greater um, talking about the Dark Tower section. Mm-hmm. But but I mean, this week, yeah, we've we've got the idea of of symbols and faith. We've got mm-hmm. the rain in Spain falls mainly on the plain. <laughs> um, we've, we, we've we've sort of. We sort of have a we, we sort of had the Leland and Gaunt connection to like a man who feeds on a town eating itself alive. Sure. Um, there's probably some other stuff in there. I guess my my recurring question to you is going to be: Are you surprised at how little a role Father Callahan is playing in the story so far? I keep expecting him to to jump into the story in a bigger way. Mm-hmm. Um, because he was introduced it's not like he's just oh he's just a, a, a completely irrelevant character that that no he, he he's had his character introduction chapter yeah um uh but he hasn't come back since then yeah i mean he's definitely in the periphery of the story and we are well over halfway through it at this point right so so i mean i i'm sure he'll come back into it it's just it's a, it has surprised me how little he's been in it yeah yeah i mean it seems like if king is going to revisit a character from one of his previous novels like a more major player in those novels would would make more sense, or maybe it's the fact that he wasn't a major player that is why he, he was so attracted to returning to the character. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. We'll we'll talk about it as we continue with the story. Sure. All right, let's move on to our discussion question. Last week's question was a fun one, and I really enjoyed y'all's answers. Last week we asked if a good friend came to you today saying that a vampire is in your house right now, what would you do? What would it take to convince you? that they are telling the truth yeah great answers i love these all right this will be fun Mm -hmm. um dies cover weekly said i wouldn't believe them even if my most trusted friend or family member came to me crying covered in in blood i would just think they were trying to pull an elaborate joke on me i'm not totally distrustful in nature but vampires to me feel too far into fiction territory i could not be convinced even if i saw a vampire sucking someone's blood although the terror of seeing someone who thinks they are a vampire would be very real indeed I think that's a perfectly rational answer and you would be the first one to die if there was a real vampire. <laughs> yeah. See, see that, that that's the thing. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a very, I'm a very skeptical person, but that at a certain point you start asking yourself is the reason why we have so many stories about vampires and not but possibly because they're real. Yeah. I mean, the the most fun part of this question to me is like positing if it's a person you trust greatly, right? Like, like if you are a person that I, I trust pretty implicitly, like if you tell me something, I'm going to believe you. So if you came to me with this, like, would I immediately believe that the vampires are real because you told me? No. But would I be like, huh? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I think, I think, yeah, right. I think it would be more like, okay, something, something really weird is going on. Yeah. I'm not necessarily going to just believe that your assessment of what's going on is the correct one but I'm not going to assume that you're just making things up. Right, right. So moving on, we have Other Worlds 1999 who says, when you read this week's discussion question, my first thought was the line from the town. Ben Affleck's character says to his best friend, I need your help. I can't tell you what it is. You can never ask me about it later and we're going to hurt some people. Jeremy Renner's classic response is, whose car are we going to take? As Matt mentioned, my reaction would be dependent on how well I knew someone and how level-headed I believed them to be. But if someone I trusted like that said... To come help me with vampires, I'd say, I'll bring the garlic. Maybe it's a lifetime of reading Stephen King, but my mind is open to other worlds. I may not necessarily believe in such things, but I don't think it would take too much to convince me. Yeah, that's uh, that, that that's funny because I think I have at least one friend who who would actually just say, I'll bring the garlic mm-hmm. um, um, because they're very open to this sort of thing. But uh, yeah, that's that, that's that, I don't think I would answer that. I would I would maybe pack some garlic secretly. <laughs> Um, all right. Uh, but, just, but just for this really good 
pasta sauce you're gonna make yeah right and and then if something then if it turns out to be needed then i'll just be like i just happen to have this <laughs> um the omnambulist says not counting the dark tower salem's lot is my first book about vampires at all wow and, and never being keen on reading one up to the point you picked it for season two stephen king had to write the story in a way that makes me believe in the topic so far he did First, the book starts with very little supernatural stuff that everybody can relate to in reality and increases the dose in homeopathic steps. Those include experiments and observation to examine the actual existence of vampires and how to deal with them, which brings us back to the Greek antiquity, not myth mythology this time, in which the proving science has its, has its origin. What you, what you don't see, you don't believe. This psychological trick turned my initial skepticism about weird and uninteresting vampires step by step into a thrill of anticipation. I am now ready to check the bedroom in the upper floor, lock my windows at night, and pay a visit to the Marston house. What could possibly go wrong there? Wow, so a convert. Domnambulist yeah. now believes in vampires. That's very fun. We did it. We did it. <laughs> Was this our goal? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> he will be the one that survives yeah, the vampire attack. There you go. All right, we have ALH84001, who says, you guys have me kind of stumped with a question this week. The honest answer is probably nothing. I'm a hardcore skeptic by nature, so my first thought would be that my friend has gone nuttier than a 10-pound fruitcake. But if it was desperation and their plea was palpable enough, I might play along for their sake. Put on my garlic sash, sharpen a few steaks, paint a cross on my forehead, and go along for the ride. Worst case, they're not delusional, and holy shit, vampires are real. But at the very least, I'd have at least one crazy story to tell about my friend before we send him off to the nut house. I have to say, your version of playing along for their sake is extremely hardcore. <laughs> like Matt's like, yeah, I might sneak some garlic in my bag. Yeah. But AL84 yeah. is like, no, I'm I'm wearing the full outfit. Right. You get up to the point of like having the steak over the heart of someone who looks suspiciously like a vampire. <laughs> and then you're like, no, I'm just playing along. I really want to follow through with this with you, bud. But and then, of course, the vampire kills you. <laughs> All right, Pear Jane says, for most of my friends, I'd assume they're throwing me a giant surprise party, so I'd rush over to help without question. <laughs> <laughs> Too many of my friends know I have an autographed, autographed photo of Jerry Dandridge uh, right next to Buffy and Angel artwork in my office. I'd probably put my, on my Sunnydale High School t-shirt before heading over and grab a sharp stick from the backyard just for fun. Or maybe put in fake fangs and yell, I have accepted your invitation when I burst in the door. But if my kid called to tell me, I'd take them seriously. Kids can find great fun in practical jokes, but I always try to treat their fears seriously because blowing off fear does nothing to allay it. In addition, if my home alone kid is calling me about an intruder, I wouldn't mess around. I'd likely ask what, why they think that. And if it seems for real, I'd tell them to get to a safe place and lock the door and call 911 or a neighbor. I'm on my way. In either case, if I walked in the house and there's an actual vampire, I'm probably going to die. <laughs> But at least I'll do it in fake fangs or in the name of saving a kid. Now that I think of it, I should keep a cross near my door because even though I haven't been to church in 20 plus years, if I'm facing down an actual vampire, I 100% believe that cross will work. If vampires are real, it's all real. And I have been preparing my entire life for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. This makes me want to put crosses up in every room, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Matt, Just... you're very, very devout. Yes. Oh, you know. When we were house shopping last year, um, we were looking at a lot of different houses. And one of the houses we looked at was obviously a a very, a very, ex like, very hardcore Catholic family because they had not just crosses, but like full on crucifixes everywhere all over the house. And now I'm thinking maybe they just really believed in vampires. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if if this is real, it's all real. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, all right. Next up, we have Baby Can You Dig Your Sam, who says, First off, I would be totally skeptical, and because I work in the mental health field, I would be very concerned about my friend's mental health. I'm also a problem solver by nature, so I try and attack the things that I may have some control or influence over versus things beyond my control. In this instance, I'm sure I'd focus on the problem. My friend is feeling terrified and believing something crazy. What can I do to allay their fears and help them feel supported? I would also do some reality testing, suggest alternative causes for what's going on or factors they may have influenced their that may have influenced their belief, i.e. how much sleep have they been getting, what was the last time they ate, other major stressors, stressors in their life, have they been drinking, etc.? Posing alternative explanations in supportive and kind way may begin to calm the person's fear. And if they wanted to get me a cross or some garlic, I'd do it. 
Why not? If it helps them feel calmer, that's a good thing. Now, that's what I would do in the moment addressing the core problems that my friend is terrified of something. Once I'm sitting alone in my own thoughts, the seed of fear and paranoia they planted would start to germinate in my own mind. It's impossible to prove that something doesn't exist. The absence of proof of existence does not mean that something doesn't exist. It just means there's no physical evidence that it does. So while I may be 99.99% sure that fairies and ghosts and vampires don't exist, there's always a very childlike part of me that clings to the possibility, to the what if. That's why horror stories are so effective on me. As Sherlock Holmes posited, when you have eliminated the impossible, impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And to me, ultimately, vampires are not impossible. They are just highly, highly improbable. So I would likely vacillate between being scared slash paranoid and laughing at my own ridic- ridiculousness. In any case, if I was confronted with total proof, like my brother is fangy and floating outside my bedroom window, I could go from my friend is crazy to holy shit, there are vampires pretty damn quickly. And having that cross and garlic at hand may be really helpful. I love that answer because it took a, a big turn in the middle. Yeah, right. I, I mean, these, these are all such fun answers because, yeah. because the truth is that there's there's how there's how we want to think that we would respond rationally and then how we can honestly say we probably would yeah. respond if we had a loved one who was insistent you know mm-hmm. um uh, matt before we move, go on what uh-huh. what would it take for you to believe this is there any way someone could say something to you that would make you believe that they saw a vampire or would they have to be able to show you proof um, I, I, I think, I think if one of my most trusted people told me that they saw a vampire, I would probably be like, all right, tell me exactly what you saw. And, okay, let's say they do that. And and then I would try to be like, all right, what, what of this can we not explain by crazy person cosplaying as a vampire? <laughs> And and if they say that they saw a, a vampire like fly or, or something like flying through the window, then I would be like, okay, you're probably going crazy, <laughs> but I'm gonna what we're gonna we're gonna check we're gonna check before I try to have you committed. So so you're saying without physical tangible evidence, there is nothing a person could say to you that would convince you. Well, it's all in probabilities. The, the, I, I never, I never think in absolutes. Okay. I, I, I would think if if you or maybe like two other people said <laughs> that you saw a vampire, uh, or, or that a vampire flew in your window and tried to kill you or something, I, I would, I would increase my odds of vampires being real from like ten to the minus five percent <laughs> to like ten to the minus three percent. That's not that much. <laughs> It's a factor of a hundred, Scott. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I don't know. I don't actually know how how much credence I would put in it if you were really insistent. I would, I don't know, maybe one percent or something like that. Still, still very low objectively. Sure, but much higher than any sane person would believe. Um, and I would, and and the thing is, if you think there's a one percent chance, um, you know that there's a bomb in your closet that's going to blow up and kill everyone in your neighborhood then you should check because it's a one percent chance of an extremely bad outcome so if there's a one percent chance there's a vampire you better fucking check um so i i I, this is just a thing about me and the way i think i I don't i just think in terms of how much does it move the probabilities around i don't think does it convince me i'm like i don't i don't think that way so at what probability percentage would you start wearing a crucifix is it one percent? Oh, oh yeah, I'd be wearing a crucifix if if you told me there was a vampire. I'd be like, yeah, <laughs> but better safe than sorry. Okay, okay. It doesn't cost go. anything. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's yeah. true. I mean, it costs however much a crucifix cost. That's true. Which they but, can be very expensive. But then that just makes for a fun story later. Sure. Um. All right. Um. Next from Dark Tower Junkie nineteen. If a friend tried to tell me something supernatural was occurring, would I believe them? The short and sweet answer is probably. Slightly longer response has me quoting Fox Mulder, saying, I want to believe. Wouldn't life be so much cooler if vampires and ghosts actually did exist? No! (laughs) (laughs) Also more terrifying, but 
so is a root canal and we deal with that shit every day okay but a root canal does not eat you Uh uh-huh yeah yeah um i think everyone has a list in their head of what they could actually survive i've grown up on horror movies so I'm so ready for nearly anything except Cenobites. Nobody's ready for them. You're the one that dies in the movie because you think you know the rules of the movie. Yeah. You're you're Randy and Scream 2. Yeah. You know, the other funny thing is we we do have things in this world. We have like grizzly bears. We have black mamba snakes. We have man of wars. We have all kinds of wild shit. And honestly... We don't generally stand a chance against any of it. Yeah, but we've successfully removed it from the daily existence of our lives. Yeah. Yeah, but if you found yourself in a room with a grizzly bear, you you know, there's 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 no there's no you can't hold up a crucifix. You're just like, oh okay. This so you're saying so you're saying a vampire is actually less threatening than no. a grizzly bear. No, I'm saying if I'm saying if you if 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 we if we still no, I'm saying we're we're we are even more dead meat when it comes to supernatural monsters. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, because they all have like cheat codes. Like you they, either use a crucifix or find out how they died, or that's true. They do have cheat codes. Yeah. So, so your argument is actually vampires are potentially less deadly than grizzly bears because you could potentially figure out what their their hack is. Yeah, like if if you're if if I'm in a room and at one end of the room is a vampire and at the other end of the room is a grizzly bear. I'm like, well, at least I know if I make a cross with my hands, it might work. On the vampire. Might, yeah, it might work. Yeah. I don't think there's anything I could do to the grizzly bear. Like there's no magic anti grizzly bear rock. There is, there is not. I want to throw the question <laughs> back at you now. What, what, what would it take for someone to say to you? Is there something someone could say to you to make you think? I don't, a vampire. I don't think there's anything someone could say to me. I, I just don't I just don't believe it. I just don't believe that stuff exists. And I, I like even the person I trusted the most. I just don't think I would just I would just take their word for it. I would need to be shown some sort of evidence of it. I just couldn't buy into it. Like, I think I think what people are saying, people are being very honest and saying part of them would want to buy into it. And I think I'm there, too. Like, there's part of me that would go. Oh, cool. <laughs> that that makes the world seem a little more unknown and make things that I didn't think possible suddenly think possible. But like, like I have, I have a friend, um, Gentry, you've met him who he yeah. believes he believes in ghosts, like legitimately. And I'm not like calling him out. I'm not saying that's ridiculous. I, I don't believe in that stuff, but he legitimately believes in it. And we've had conversation after conversation about how he's convinced he's seen a ghost before and we the conversations always end the same way where i'm like look man i i know you believe what you saw i do not believe that you saw what you saw yeah right i think that's totally fair it's a bit of a unintuitive operation but like if i saw someone flying in the in the dead of night Mm -hmm. in the sky my my probability estimate that vampires are real would increase. My probability estimate that I have lost my mind would also increase. <laughs> both of these things can be like, like both at the same time. Sure. Right. Um, and, and honestly, probably I've lost my mind. I'm hallucinating. Like it's, it's way more likely that I'm hallucinating, but it would actually be incorrect to just dismiss the possibility that, that what you saw was real completely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um so yeah i don't know i don't i don't remember where right. i was going with that but no i mean i think you're right it's t- yeah. <laughs> it's t- it's t- like I, I love these answers though so let's move on to yep. uh walking to 22 okay right or did um, we read this one already i don't think uh, we did. no we did not it's just they also mention x files so that's yes. what confused us walking to 22 says as to this week's question i'm all in like agent Moulter, i want to believe i want there to be monsters in the dark so when my friends tell me there's a vampire next door i'm going full-on frog brothers it's time to raid the local catholic church and get me some holy water hit up the Lowe's and buy some steaks hit up the safeway and buy all the garlic they have hit up the walmart and buy some super, super soakers for the holy water hit up the bible bookstore for anointing oil communion wafers and gideon new testaments of course i would be cautious about staking someone but if they sleep in a coffin in their basement with windows painted black don't they deserve what they get better safe than sorry say thank you (laughs) Uh, i wonder if there's like a a homeland security database that tracks like vampire staking 
stuff you know like like if you get flagged if your credit card buys all the, all the stuff on the same night and they're like oh we got another one only one way to find out scott yeah you're right let's do it all right i'm going to lowe's <laughs> um that, that's very funny all right uh, eric t says I've had it happen where a friend claims it's supernatural and the feeling is very much what King hits here with the, I, I do not doubt what you were saying in your interpretation of the truth coupled with the, uh, there ain't no way that's real. For instance, a friend said they were driving to find, to, to try to find a high school party and were lost out in the cornfield somewhere and saw something cross the road that was not an animal they could identify. Super freaked out about it. Full disclosure, I am an organic chemist by training and currently work on analytical chemistry. Uh, so my mindset is not necessarily going to match with the random invi- individual. But I started with st- with the state of mind, were you drinking? What else is in your system? Um, if they're a reliable source, then we pin down the details. In this case, stone sober and not high, but late at night and at least halfway lost. So psychological stuff is not out of the question. We retraced his steps as best as possible, and I spent a lot of time on the side of the road looking for evidence and found nothing that could not be a deer, dog, or raccoon in terms of tracks and whatnot. So I cannot say that anything alien or weird did not happen, but being a scientist, that just means the preponderance of evidence does not support the claim. If he said if he said it was in his house, though, I would come in hot with as many dudes as I could roll out, because <laughs> if their actual physical safety may be an issue, that's what you do, no matter how unreasonable it seems. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I like the, the general answer of like, if someone says there's a vampire in their house, it's probably not a vampire, but there could be a dude in their house. I better come yeah. help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like that too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting. I, I like that this person actually has like a story of someone claiming the supernatural yeah. because it, it just reminded me of a, of a time that I had a friend telling me a story about like a very eerie night that they spent like going to some cabin in the middle of the woods and... um and and, all, and and like a couple of sort of borderline weird things happened. And then they said, um, and then in the middle of the night, the horn of their car just started blaring and that it was like the freakiest thing ever and that their car had never done that before and they'd never had any problems with it. Yeah, that's pretty freaky. And then I was like, it was the middle of the night and they were like, yeah. And I was like, was it really cold? And I'm like, oh yeah, it got really cold. It got like super cold. And I was like, and, and, and you didn't really, you didn't live in a cold place. So you drove to the cold place and then it got really cold. I know where this is going. And the metal contracted and caused the contacts of your horn to go off. Um, but, but like that's never, you would never think of that when you're already freaked out. Sure. And in, 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 in a creepy situation, right? Yeah. So like that's the thing is you don't think of things, especially when they're weird and require several steps of logic like that. Um, uh, you you don't think of those things. You're gonna see you're gonna see an alien, even though it's probably a deer. Yeah. Well, and I think that like I think that's part of our evolution as a, an animal, right? Is yeah. like we immediately go to the explanation that involves something out there as a threat to me, and I need to respond directly to that threat instead of here's the calm logical explanation for this that means I'm totally safe. Like for evolutionarily. It may, it's better for us to overreact to a perceived threat than to underreact. Right. Exactly. So, yep. Totally. Yeah. Yep. You're, you're, uh, it's perfectly said. Yep. Yeah. All right. We, next we have Gerardo who says, of course I would be skeptical and wouldn't believe them. I believe everything has a natural explanation. I have no religious beliefs nor paraphernalia. Thus I'm absolutely empty handed when I meet my doom face to face. So where did my mind go next? Hey, would it be so bad to be a vampire and potentially live forever? <laughs> <laughs> if i could have consciousness live and think enjoy books and life maybe but if my eyes were the windows that looked into an empty room no thanks yeah well and, the, and then the flip side of it is like wait a minute if if vampires are real and then that implies all of the religious supernatural stuff is real then i'm going to to go like a knight templar to my death yeah because i'm going to heaven man yeah yeah that's that that's great this is but great that, news. But that's the thing about faith, man. It's not supposed to work that way. You're not well, supposed to need that. Then you're just Thomas. I I'm just going to I'm just going to go whole hog and hope that it all works out. <laughs> okay. Just go in swinging. All right. What if, can if, what can go wrong? If I kill the vampire, it'll be it'll be awesome and then I'll have the rest of my life to sort of struggle with this. And then if the vampire kills me, then hopefully I get some sort of bonus. What if he turns you into a vampire though? Um I would try to avoid that. Is outcome. your soul? Does your soul freed? I don't know. Depends yeah. on the details. Yeah. 
Uh, all right, next from Complicated9519. As someone who does believe in the supernatural and believes something supernatural has happened to them, I'd most likely believe my friend that something that something has happened. But at the same time, I am a skeptic. As cool as it'd be for werewolves and vampires and the like to exist, it's hard to believe without concrete proof that they do. I find myself, I always find myself trying to trying to debunk things on the internet. I see when things go too crazy. Like if you go to the TikTok, some, some things you watch and are like purely bullshit. Why didn't you turn and look around the corner? <laughs> Your friend is probably hiding there. But then you also see things without an explanation and you're like, yeah, that seems real. I also listen to the podcast, Two Girls, One Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all about very good. And it's all about the paranormal. So all all in all, if you told me that your house was haunted, I'd believe you without solid proof. But if you told me you were possessed by a demon or a vampire was living in your basement, I need something as proof, even if it was just a video. Ah, I see. So you draw the line a little bit different than I would, but you're still drawing a line. Yeah, a, a little bit more credibility but still requiring some evidence for for real certainty yeah yeah wouldn't it be funny if there were if there was like one supernatural thing but it was like the chupacabra (laughs) and there's nothing there's nothing else supernatural it's just chupacabras it's i i think it'd be better if it was bigfoot like everything else is bullshit except there's there's a bigfoot that's that's actually better somehow i I don't know how though. But it it's because there's just one. Like chupacabras, yeah. I think they're supposed to be multiple, just right? One, I don't know. Yeah, just one Bigfoot. Yeah, yeah. Okay. just one Bigfoot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we have next. We have Steve L. Who said, "If a good friend told me there's a real vampire in the house, I would think they're messing with me." Uh, then. Uh, if after they kept at it, I would play along, but not really believe. But as the confrontation got close and I could feel the stress and anxiety from my friend, I would start to believe I would do what should be done with vampires as best I can in case they were right. So, I mean, that's a cool thing. It's like, there's a lot of like, I would not believe them at first, but if they were really insistent, their insistency would maybe start to win me over. Yeah. It's interesting because I, this is actually causing me to consider like, what if my friend didn't say there's a vampire, but what if they just said said something that didn't fit into any box of, of just like the, they, they said they saw something that made no sense, right? Mm-hmm. Something impossible. Like mm-hmm. how would that, how does that fit in? Cause it's not, cause, cause if it's, if they say vampire, then you're like, okay, you're, you're, you're insane. But if they say, you know, they saw teleportation, then you're just like, okay, I don't know what to do with that. You, you, I, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this. It's just interesting. Interesting questions about how we weigh other people's eyewitness testimony. Yeah. 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 All right. Last uh, answer from Jennifer D. If my friend called me and asked me to come over because there's a vampire in her house, I would assume it is it was code for wanting to day drink. <laughs> I would head over right away, stopping for vodka. Ride or, ride or die, boo. I got you. <laughs> well, there we go. From now on, my internal code for I'm drunk is there's a vampire at my house. Yeah. yeah. So, Matt, if I ever tell you there's a vampire at my house, it means I'm wasted. All right. So, I, I show up at your house with with a, a fifth of, of, of vodka and, yeah. and the vampire rips my throat out. I mean, maybe just make it like blessed vodka. Just, just in case, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I will. Would that work? I don't think that would work. I don't think that would work. It doesn't hurt to try. It doesn't hurt to try. You're right. You're right. All right, folks. That was a really fun question. I think we got another fun one for next week. So here we go. Matt, you want to read this one? Sure. If you were a blood sucking fiend, hypothetically, where would you want to set up your mid-level vampiring scheme and why? So, yeah, where? A, a town, um, a, a real place? Where would you want to set it up? What would be a good place to set up your whole vampire deal? And what kind of business would you open as a front? Yeah. Would it be an antique store? You know, we, know. Haven't, you know we haven't had yet what? is uh, vampires on a train. <laughs> Where's Michael? I was just, just you know, it's a good premise, right? Vampires anyway. on a train would be very good. That'd be very good. That's Wait, because so, everything on a train is very good. So question, would they run the train? Like, is the conductor a vampire? I think they do. I think that that's the whole gimmick is like they they get, they arrange to get people on the train who they want. And then they go down the train car by car. It's an overnight train, of course. It's an overnight train. This would be very effective. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll, this is we'll, a good we'll, idea. Let's make we'll, this story. Yeah. Let's workshop it. All right. Train pyre. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. For now. 
<laughs> it needs to, let's workshop it. I don't know. I don't know if we're going to settle on that name yet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that is it for us here this week on Kingslingers. Next week, we are back in Salem's Lot as we continue the book. We were talking about chapter 11, Ben 4 next week. Matt, did you know there are only 14 chapters in Salem's Lot? We're on chapter 11 now. No, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it just so happens the chapter 14 is 160 pages long, so we're going to be breaking that one up. Um, Okay, well, that makes more sense. Yes. Chapter 11, Ben 4 is our chapter for next week. All right. Uh, Remember, you can reach out to us via email at kingslingerspod at gmail.com or on Twitter at kingslingerspod, or you can head on over to the subreddit at r slash doofmedia. And if you like the, the, if you're not, I, I jumped ahead. If you're not already subscribed to Kingslingers, we strongly recommend you do so and make sure you never miss an episode. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere in the world you can listen to casts in your pod. That's right. And if you like any of the shows on the Doof Network and you want to support us, then please consider donating to our Patreon account at patreon.com slash doofmedia. Uh, it will let you see all kinds of cool bonus features that we make, um, including me and Scott doing our other levels of the tower YouTube show where we just talk or not YouTube show podcast mm-hmm. where we talk about Stephen King adaptations. This week we have new doof dancers, G border and Terry S and new doof trooper Mina Jin. Welcome. We hope you enjoy that stuff. Yeah. I uh, hope you have checked out our episode on thinner Mina Jin and everyone who is at the doof trooper level. If you haven't listened to that episode yet, what are you doing? Yeah. Of course, if you cannot afford to donate to us right now, that is absolutely okay. This podcast right here will always be free and you can always help it out for free by just sharing it with all your friends, sharing it on social media and everywhere you possibly can. And you can always help us out by leaving a rating and a review. That's free too. This week's spotlight review comes from Velcro C who gives us five stars and says hooked one episode in Found out about this podcast from a Malazan reading group on Discord. What is what's what's that? It's a fantasy series. Oh, so I've someone's been listening one. to our advice and and uh, sharing things on every possible platform. There we go. Now I'm rereading the Dark Tower series with this podcast. First episode was excellent. Well, thank you so much, Velcro. I don't know if you're going to be listening to this episode, but uh, if you get to it, thank you so much. Whenever people say first episode was excellent, is there a part of you that goes, "Uh oh, what if he doesn't like the second one?" <laughs> Because every time I see a review like that, I'm like, oh, I sure hope they like the second one. (laughs) No, no, man. They'll like the second one. Don't worry. Okay. All right, folks. That is going to do it for us this week. Hope you enjoyed the episode. And we will see you right back here next week as we continue to make our way through the ever more vampire filled Salem's Lot. Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. (laughs) 